Digital Maker Fair. You are on the Maker Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Maker Fair Learning Makers Track. Right now, I am joined by Wade Sims, who is a teacher out at Gaston High School. And we're going to be starting off this track, which is geared towards 7th to 12th graders, um, talking about maker spaces and how to get kids involved and uh, what kind of tools and project ideas we can use to inspire the next generation of makers. So first off, um, we are going to kick off with an intro video highlighting the manufacturing program out at Gaston. And hi, and we will join you again shortly. One of the things that we do at Gaston High School is an, our advanced manufacturing class runs a small business out of there. So this is one of the t-shirts that we are making for a local winery, uh, Ken Wright Cellars. And so here's the graphic. The kids have taken um, their designs redraw them in our Rhino program and then we can do a number of things once we have these in the digital vector format. We can use them with our vinyl cutter, we can use them here on the printer, the t-shirt printer, we can use the laser engraver, uh, CNC router, anything that we want to use once we have this put into the CAD program. And so that's what we're going to use over here. And then on the other computer I have a vector set and ready to cut out. Um, this is just a Disney graphic um, of Darth Mouse and um, a different setup as you can see. These are just outlines so that the cutter can follow those outlines whereas the other one is a solid print so that the printer will print those solidly. Alright so I'll come around to the printers. So what I have here set up is the vinyl cutter and so this Roland uh, GX24 vinyl cutter is what we're going to use to cut the um, the mouse decal and then we will use a heat press set up to press that onto a shirt over here we have the t-shirt printer and this t-shirt printer I've already loaded the t-shirt and, and ironed it and have it set and ready to go and so we are ready for this to run. All right, so we have here now the print all ready to go. And the, the printer is set up, so I'm going to go ahead and run this file. See, we're cutting out the mouse. Okay, and while that one's running, we're going to go ahead and start this t shirt printer. Same exact idea. The printer's going to get ready to go with that. It says press the start key, so I'll press the start key checking the shirt to make sure it's at the correct level and it says please press the down button a few times so I'll do that and then go ahead and hit go and there we have it so inside of here just like a regular printer that print head is just working across the shirt just like that okay and while that prints we'll take a look at this one this print is all done It'll be hard to see it right now, but what I'll do uh, in the meantime is I will pick that picture out and then we'll get ready to press that onto a shirt. As you can see here, I have picked that vinyl or weeded it is the correct, correct term. And so we have placed this now on the shirt on the t-shirt press. And so what we do with this one now is we're going to put our cover sheet on. This is a silicone cloth just to cover that, keep everything safe. We're going to swing our press around, line it up, and then we're going to press this 
We have a timer on this set for 18 seconds at 305 degrees. And so we're going to go ahead and just press that until the timer goes off. And then we will peel. This is a hot peel vinyl, so we will peel that um, while the vinyl is still hot. So there the timer goes off. Lift that, swing this out of the way. We're going to pull that guy. And then we will hot peel. I stand corrected. That's cold peel vinyl. So we'll let that cool off. While that cools off, we will come around here to the t-shirt printer where you can see the Ken Wright Sellers logo has printed out and that's just ink, but the ink is not set. So in the bottom here, we have this little oven set to 173 degrees Celsius, 350-ish. Fahrenheit. So we close that up. We're going to lock that. And that ink will set now for three minutes under the heat. The plate will come down real close and we'll let that run for a little bit. Um, we'll get this guy. We'll peel that once that has cooled down enough. And we can see here uh, every once in a while you get a one that wants to be tricky. So um, sometimes we got to let these cool down all the way. It looks like that one's going to take just fine. And so we'll go ahead and peel that. Let's see they're nice and close. How oh, that's just coming off. Now, I'll come back to that once I peel it. I need two hands. All right, finally we have our finished product. You can see here we have both shirts all the way completed. We've got our vinyl. And we have our print. Two different technologies. Uh, one has advantages over the other. Uh, the simplicity of just printing on a t-shirt, baking it for a couple minutes and having it be done and in a format that will last a long, long time. Versus vinyl where you can have a whole number of colors, you can layer these colors to have multis uh, as you will see in one of the other videos. Uh, the disadvantage is vinyl is only good for about 50 washes, maybe. Uh, and that's if you do not put that in the dryer. So uh, vinyl is a little bit temperamental. Printing, um, you're limited with certain things such as um, colors. Dark shirt like this, you really can only plant, print black or, or very dark color on there. Uh, and even then that's not going to show up super well. But with the lighter colored shirts, you have a full color spectrum including photographs that you can do with that type of printer. So um, nice to have a couple different technologies and be able to accomplish a couple of different goals. Wow, look at that. We have these right here. How crazy. <laughs> it's amazing they just show up like that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the making process and bringing making into the classroom. Sure. Um, I'll give you some background. I started out almost 16 years ago now and uh, primarily wood shop. And then I, I had some mentors, which are always important. Yes. <laughs> and um, some of them, you know. So these mentors, uh, John Niebergall in particular, he got me started with my first final cutter, which is the one that was in the video. And um, from there, we just kind of took it. We have laser engravers. We have um, all the 3D printing, large format printers, CNC routers, just a all number the fun of toys. everything that's, that you can imagine just about that's run by computer, computer design. So, um, and we have a lot of fun. Uh, this year, we're really expanding the vinyl so uh, taking a wrapping class. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I'm going to learn how to how to wrap vehicles and and I oh, not like 
breaking no, no, no. down and rapping. <laughs> you do not want to hear me rap, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, no, for vinyl rapping. Okay. And, and one of the things we hope to do is is with our football helmets. Oh, that's so cool. Those. So the kids are very excited about that. And that's it's so cool too when you when you think about digital making. Um, not everybody realizes how much it translates into physical making as well. Um, and in, excuse us, technical difficulties. All right, we continue. <laughs> and, and when you're doing digital making with kids, uh, what do you see is that like most excites them? The, the vinyl stuff really does the vinyl and printing. They, they just seem to can't get enough of it. And for some 3d printing, just resonates uh, for me 3d printing's okay um, but we can't do a lot of useful things with the printers we have you can make little trinkets um, but the laser engraver is also huge because we have photo program and kids can do family photos oh, that's and, cool. and light them up so we do a lot of that kind of stuff the mantra in my class is to get in over your head and figure a way out Awesome. And that's, that's what we try to do a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. And I know that we have a few clips of some of the students in the making that they've done. Um, so we're going to cut to that really quick and show off one of the cool projects of a few of the students. I'm Jordan. I'm Maribel. And we're students at Gaston High School. And we're gonna show you how to use the uh, vacuuming for our 3D bolts. So this goes into here, and then timer, and then. Click it up, push all the way up and click, there you go. And then you place your mold in here. And then what are we watching for, Jordan? Um, for it to like start sinking just a little bit. And then when the timer goes off, you want to bring it down to make your mold. But you want to make sure it doesn't bubble. Okay. What are we seeing right now? What's starting to happen um, here? The um, thing is sinking down, melting. Okay. About how far until we want to push that down? Um, right about now, actually, is a good time. Go ahead and push that down. Just drop it. Nope. Student from Gaston School District, and I'm about to do my vacuum on straight About how far should this sag down before you pull the print? Do you think? Uh, right now? It's getting really close. See how that's starting to sag? Yeah. Okay, timer's about to go off. Okay, pop it down. Just pop it, pop it. Whole thing. Whole thing. Okay. 
Here we have one that's cooled off already so and ready out. to pop out. Okay, now we have a mold ready for making chocolate. Man, I never would think about making chocolates in a manufacturing class. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, you know, the process is just in manufacturing, you, you make a prototype, make a mold of it, and then, and then you produce. You go through that process yeah. of making. Yep. Yeah. And it, it helps the kids really see that this object, when I make a mold of it and then pour a mold, it, it's the object again in whatever epoxy plastic chocolate chocolate <laughs> right yeah and and you know now they can go home and say oh it's christmas time yeah and i want to make chocolates for the family and they could make a whole tray of those there you go christmas yeah. presents all wrapped up yep, exactly <laughs> uh one of the great things that i loved in high school was that instant gratification of making right like, like you mentioned you the students they they created on the computers and then they like then they get to physically hold it Right. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. Yep. And we we don't always create everything we 3D print. We go onto some of those websites like Instructables and Thingiverse. Tinkercad. And Tinkercad. Right. And they just find something interesting and and print it. Someone printed a, a worm that was moved. You know, oh, that's that moved. Cool. So there is neat stuff that they'd like to find and, and print and filament's cheap. So I just say go for it and, <laughs> and have some fun. And that's that's the whole point of making too. So it's awesome yeah. that you get to have that in a classroom environment and reach students of all kinds, right? Yep, exactly. Um, and that's that's really cool. We have another video here talking a little bit more about the process of the printing and the stickers that you all have in your program. Right. And we're gonna cut to that and talk about that a little more after. Hi, we're your students at Gaston High School, and we're going to show you how to use the vinyl cutter. Oh. So, I started out with this drawing here, and I kind of customized it a bit, and I turned it into this. And then you can take this and insert it into the vinyl cutter by getting ready. Print. And then you just work out the proportions. Okay. And then once you're done with that and you have everything set up on your vinyl cutter, you just hit print. And I'll start printing. Hi, I'm Isaiah. I'm from uh, Gaston High School. I'm a 10th grader. And uh, from when we last printed our uh, thing from the vinyl printer, this is what we got. This is what it looks like before picking. And once we pick it, this is what it looks like. And then you're finished. And then you can do whatever you want with it. Wow, thank you to all the your high schoolers for sharing their projects with us. <laughs> they were so excited. Happy to do it. That's awesome. And so I saw the 3D CAD modeling software. That was Rhino 3D, correct? Yeah, that's Rhino 3D. Um, so we draw in, in the Rhino program. They learn how to extrude surfaces and, and make how they want it to be. And then each 3D printer has its own proprietary software that then they have to drop that into in a STL style format. Um, and then they manipulate it. They can adjust settings in the printer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they're printing in a PLA plastic or maybe we're using the flexible filament. Oh, that stuff's really cool. It is, yeah, so much fun. Uh, but they have to change settings. So it's good for them to learn, mess with the setting. If it works good on that, 
use it and you're if getting not, you have into to the manipulate it some more yeah, yeah the material science of things as well and yeah, exactly. it's not just the modeling or just the design but then the implementation of that as well yeah exactly yep we try to use as many different materials as we can do you have a chocolate printer i wish <laughs> <laughs> all right next thing to add yeah, to the maker right. space they make those <laughs> i i think so I, uh, I would imagine yeah. <laughs> the next video we have is talking a little bit more about applying the stickers and the pieces that the students have made. Hi, uh, we're students of the Gaston manufacturing class and today we are showing you how to put the transfer tape. Uh, I have a positive print, I have a negative and then we're just going to show you uh, how to put the transfer tape on and squeegee it. So. Normally what you want to do is start from the middle and then slowly just roll it out because that gets most of the bubbles out. Yeah, I screwed it up. And sometimes if you mess up, you just have to slowly take it off and retry. Without trying to damage it at all. And then we have felt covered squeegees just so it doesn't ruin the sticker at all. And you just want to start from the inside and out. You want to get all the bubbles out, as many possible, but they're not going to infect it a huge deal. And where are these stickers going to go? Uh, these are going to go on the trunk of my car. Hi, my name is Adrian Patsloff. I'm part of the Gaston Manufacturing class, and I'm making a sticker to uh, sell to people, and it's a multi-layer uh, sticker. So we have multiple different vinyl layers, and we use the transfer tape to get one layer of a color onto the next layer. So right here I have it. I'm getting it off the transfer tape. Sometimes it's hard to get all of your dots onto the transfer tape. Push your fingers together real hard. There you go. Peel it like a banana. There you are. There we go. And now that you have that. Take our squeegee. There we go. That's multi flare. All right. Sticker. Thank you. So that's really cool seeing the layering of these stickers. It's almost like layering a 3D object as well and getting yeah. that design and that art incorporated in your classes as too. What is the coolest experience you have had as a teacher with your students and their creativity? Oh, geez. Um, Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, but that's... And, and with your students watching. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, there's, there's so many, but it's really cool when you get a kid who just challenges himself so hard. Um, I had one student build a sticker this year that was amazing. And he just sat quietly. I didn't really know what he was up to. And next thing you know, up on Working the board is this really awesome seven layer sticker. Oh, wow. And it, it, that stuff's really cool when I see that happen. So that's, that's what we're going for. That's awesome. Yeah. And so are these the only classes at Gaston High School that have these hands-on interactions? Or do students have other opportunities outside of this as well? Sadly, not really. Um, aside from what I teach, there's there's a actually that's not true. We just started a, clo a coding class. Oh, awesome! So so one of the math teachers is doing a coding class. He did a lot with Snap Circuits and some of those kits that go along with Snap Circuits yeah. this year. So that's a new one that worked out really well. And um, that's great. So yeah, that's good. So we're going to show a couple more students talking about their 3D images that they've created and kind of the basics and introduction to that. 
I'm Lexi. I'm Alex. And we're from Gaston High School. We're going to show you how to draw in 3D. Okay. So we have our shape here, and then we're going to click on it, go to solid, and extrude planar curve. You could do straight or tapered, but we're going to taper here. And then at the set point, you're going to put negative 0.5, enter on that, and then it brings you to your shape. Yeah. And now it is ready to print. <laughs> okay, so this is the design that I made. It's on here. Um, I'm going to show you how to get it to the 3D printer. So, just walk over here. It's still preheating. But once it's done preheating, you've got to find the stick figure on there. So now that it's done, yep. we can hit in there, and then build it. And then put it in there. And you can put build, and then it'll start doing its thing. That's awesome that your students get to have so many hands-on opportunities. And remind me again, is this an in-class or an after-school or both? Right, yeah. In This is all in-class. It's high school kids. Um, in that particular class, we have the intro to manufacturing students and the advanced. So we we run a makerspace business out of there. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. The intro kids are learning how to do everything. The advanced kids assist, but mostly their job is to fill orders. And that's great for you because then they get to teach each other and you get to just watch all the fun. That's exactly. That's right. Yeah. And and then that's how we fund everything. We we make and sell products and then everything goes back into the program for new equipment and so forth. And we'll be talking yeah. a little bit more later on in the track about how making an entrepreneurship coincide. Uh, there's a lot of crossover with that as just, you know, a, a thing. <laughs> so many jobs, so many yeah. jobs in there. And opportunities. Exactly, yep. I had four kids get hired last year in the machine shop in town. That's and, awesome. And there's just good paying job opportunities if you know how to do this kind of stuff. So let's say a student is watching this and they want to go to their teacher or their school and say, I want to start a makerspace or I want this here. If they want to contact you, could they reach out to you? Absolutely, yep. Yep. Um, We've got the, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Our there laser cut business card. Yeah, of course. Uh, so yeah, Wade Sims, Gaston High School. Uh, my email is simsw at gaston k12 dot org. And if you have questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you so much again, Wade, for joining us. Is there anything else that you would like to leave as kind of a closing note? Um, you, I mean, you've been doing this for years. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's it's been great, too, as a student. Um, I've gotten to learn a lot from mentors you've had as well. And there's yeah. been a lot of crossover with teacher trainings and, you know, CTE and STEM in Oregon. Yeah. You just have to be a willing to go for it. And like you guys said in the keynote, fail early. Yes, and, and fail and often. You, and fail often and just rebuild it and, and try something harder, try something new. That's the reason we have all these things. I just 
I want to learn new stuff. So <laughs> that's <laughs> what we do. And, uh, and there's nothing, just, uh, there's nothing, there's no better way that I have found about learning than making and doing. Yep, exactly. It's the best way to learn. Awesome. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, Wade, yeah, um, for joining us. And if you have any questions, again, please feel free to submit them through Menti. We will be answering these in blogs and after event interviews as well. So feel free to submit those throughout the day. Our next track, if we are ready for them, which I just got the thumbs up from our tech team. <laughs> so that's a go. Our next track is going to be Introduction to Cosplay. Come learn about the fantastic world of cosplay and how you can be a part of it. This presentation is a general overview of cosplay done by Chloe, plus some tips and tricks for getting started in the craft, as well as some advice from a very experienced cosplayer and a lifelong maker. Thank you again, Wade, for joining mm -hmm. us. And we're gonna yes. cut to the next session. Hi, I'm Chloe, and I'm here to tell you about cosplay. What is cosplay? Well, in short, it's dressing up as characters from pop culture, generally. It's like Halloween, but all year round. So what separates it from just dressing up like in a costume? What defines cosplay? There's a lot of things to factor in, but the general sense is that cosplayers pay more attention to detail than your typical Halloween store-bought costume. They oftentimes make their own costumes, whether just in part or in whole. They pour their heart and soul into it and they make it into art. That's what cosplay is. It's a form of art, it's a hobby, it's a passion. The cool thing about cosplay is that you get to bring your favorite characters to life and you get to become them. For example, I could be Tracer, or Wirt, or Dipper, or Taco, or so many more. Whether you make it all from scratch, or you just make a part of the costume, be proud of what you created and show it to the world. Cosplay is art, and just like any other form of art that you make with your hands, it deserves to be seen. The most important thing is to have fun. So where do you begin? My advice is to start small. Making an entire Master Chief costume would be epic, but it's a lot to tackle. My Tracer cosplay took an entire summer of dedicated work, and I was still pretty new to it. It was overwhelming, and I had a lot to learn, but it was fun. The best place to start is pick an area that you're interested in and pursue that, whether that be sewing, or prop making, electronics, or even wig styling. A common misconception is that you need a wig to cosplay. That's not true. You can use your own hair even if it's not the right length or color. It helps to buy a base costume and to enhance it from there. Or go thrift shopping. Thrift shops is, are the best way to start off a costume with basic clothing items. Many cosplays that I have start off from a bunch of thrift shop items. I modify them and I make them into what I want, but that way I feel like I have more creative liberty with the items that I can find. And it's much easier to start with a base piece of clothing than a bunch of fabric. So where do you go from here? You want a cosplay. Start thinking of which characters you'd like to bring to life and dress up as. Look for some resources online related to that character. Oftentimes you can learn a lot from other people's cosplays of that character or similar characters. Make a to-do list. I always start my, my cosplays with a to-do list. I sit down and make a checklist of everything I need for that character from head to toe. It helps me get a sense of how much I have to tackle and what steps are involved in the process. Sometimes I realize after laying it out on paper that I might not be ready to tackle a project that big, and that's okay. It's always good to know that before you start. Cosplay does not mean perfection. A common misconception and a roadblock for a lot of beginning and experienced cosplayers is that they get stuck in the accuracy of their cosplay. Your costume doesn't need to be screen accurate to be considered a cosplay. Some people love to make their costumes as detailed and perfect as possible, but a lot of characters don't exist in real life and don't conform to the rules of reality. Keep in mind that you're going to know way more about the character's design after the creation process than the people who see your cosplay, so little inaccuracies here and there will go completely unnoticed. Another great thing you can do is make it your own. Sometimes it's fun to take a character design and tweak it a bit to make it unique, especially with simpler characters. A lot of characters that I cosplay are from cartoons or video games, and their designs, because of how the medium that they are presented in, are just simpler. So when you translate that to real life, it can make your costumes look bland or 
you feel like you have a lot more room to play around with, feel free to do that. That's what makes cosplaying great. Another thing you can do is if you're taking a character that isn't normally humanoid and making them into a human, you can have a lot more creative liberty with how you translate their original design into your costume. For example, I did Wheatley from Portal 2, who looks like this, and I turned him into this. There are a lot of reasons and factors that went into creating that design, but I hope that that gives you a little bit of inspiration for what you possibly could do. One of the biggest tips I can give you is ask questions. The cosplay community is fantastic and full of people who are, will go leaps and bounds to help answer your questions or give you guidance. There's been many a time where I've messaged cosplayers I personally look up to, and they've taken time out of their day to help explain or show me the proper way to do something. I'm one of those cosplayers too. If you have any questions, feel free to message me and ask me about anything. No question is too small. I still ask questions all of the time as well. I'm learning and even after my years of experience, there's a lot that I don't know. So you'll never be afraid to ask questions. One of the biggest lessons I've learned in my years of cosplaying is don't overwork yourself. It's easy to get caught up in the process of making cosplay. You'll go hours painting something or sewing and you'll realize you haven't eaten or taken a sip of water. So always keep in mind to take care of yourself and remember that this is fun. Planning to go to a con? Awesome. But sometimes that can make a bit of a stressful deadline for you. So if you find that you're running out of time, keep two things in mind. If you don't finish, use what you can. No one will know that your costume isn't completed. Two, ask yourself, are you enjoying the process? If the con is in a week and you're pulling your hair out and you feel overwhelmed and stressed beyond belief, maybe take a step back, make a backup plan, wear something else and use the costume that you're working on for a later con. It'll save you some sleepless nights and you'll thank yourself later. If you don't feel like you have the motivation or heart to complete a cosplay that you've started, that's totally okay. This is a hobby, so listen to yourself and adjust accordingly. Maybe even modifying your plan last minute, which is totally fine. I ran out of time before I could make Tracer's pistols, but I'm still very proud of how the cosplay turned out as a whole and everyone loved her anyway. In whole, what did we learn? Well, cosplay is for everyone. You don't need to be an expert to make a costume and the best way to learn is by doing. So get in there, get hands on and start making. Do you want to learn more? Do you want to get started? Fantastic. The best thing I can say is to follow cosplayers online. Paying attention to others' work will both inspire and inform you about the craft. Pick your favorite social media platform, look up cosplays of your favorite characters, and get familiar with the world of cosplay. There's also a lot of great YouTube channels out there that cosplayers use to showcase their work. And oftentimes they'll include tutorials or a making of process that'll really give you an insight into how things are made. One of my favorites is Kamui Cosplay. Highly recommend, that's a great place to start. Remember to have fun and don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always here to answer questions, so get cosplaying and have a blast. Wow, that was great. And joining me from California is Chloe here to answer some Q&A. Thank you, Chloe, for joining us. And thank you for that wonderful presentation about introducing people to cosplay, uh, not only as a form of making, but as a way of expression and building a community. And uh, if you want to talk a little bit about that for a second. Yeah. Um, cosplay to me has just meant so much in getting to just explore my interests and my passions in a really unique and fun way. Um, I'm a huge nerd and geek and I grew <laughs> up that way. Um, so being able to combine that love of like the shows I watch, the games I play with art and making in, in a form of uh, being able to share that with the world too. Uh, it's, it's a really fun passion and hobby to have. And it's a fantastic way to make friends. I have a lot of yeah. friends I've made in the cosplay community um, it's, it's just been really life-changing, really. <laughs> That's awesome. And I, I, I understand the idea of, oh my gosh, I'm making this thing. I haven't eaten. I haven't drank. I haven't left my computer for hours. <laughs> Do you set reminders for yourself to, you know, take breaks or you just plow through? I mean, honestly, it depends <laughs> on the project. I really should set reminders. Um, I will be honest, while I was editing this video for this panel, I was like, 
oh, I've been going at this for hours. And I got to that part of the video and I realized I haven't eaten. For <laughs> I probably do that. So it was ironic. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, the best thing that I can do is usually when I sit down to work on something, be it cosplay or anything is like, okay, I, it's, you know, three in the afternoon, I'm going to go for an hour, then take a 15 minute break and get some tea or, yeah. you know, there's always something that I'm doing. It's not just, I'm going to go for an hour and that's it. It's always like, I'm going to go for an hour and then get a snack, or I'm going to go for an hour and then watch a fun YouTube video to get my mind off of it. Or, you know, there's always something waiting at the end to help remind me and motivate me. That's awesome. And so I know I'm curious as well as some others, what is your next big project with cosplay? That's a really good question. So I do have one that I've been working on for the past year. That's been kind of a secret. So I won't give too much away because it's kind okay. of a surprise, <laughs> but I am working with a friend. So it's not me. It's actually a collaboration project, um, which is a big step for me. And especially in like the type of collaboration it is, I'm, it's like a whole new area and that I've never explored before. So I'm really excited. <laughs> um, so I've been working on that. And then I can talk about, uh, I still do have plans for those who know me, for those who follow me at all. Um, I've been seeing a little bit of progress updates, but I do have plans to cosplay Ida the Owl Lady from the Owl House. So if you're oh, into cool. that show, that's going to be my next, next thing. That's awesome. And if people wanted to follow you or check out your cosplay, where could they find that? So I post all my cosplay on Instagram primarily. It's at mythical reality cosplay. Um, and you can find me there. That's, that's where I put all my cosplay stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you so much. And so we'll be hearing more from Chloe and more about cosplaying as a making opportunity. Next up, we are going to be hearing from Skeptoid. And Skeptoid is an award-winning weekly science podcast. Since 2006, Skeptoid has been revealing the true science behind popular misinformation and urban legends. Let's look behind the scenes at how Brian Dunning puts it all together. And before before we cut, I want to thank you again, Chloe, for joining us, and I'll be talking to you again later today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brian Dunning. I'm the host and producer of the podcast Skeptoid, which is an urban legends podcast that looks at the true history, the true science behind all the crazy stories and strange beliefs you've ever heard. The show's been weekly since 2006, so 800-something episodes so far, and we've been pretty successful, gotten a few awards, and hit 100 million downloads almost five years ago. When I started the show, it was just me by myself as a personal hobby, but now we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Here's our staff and our board of directors and advisory board, and we also do lots of other stuff, educational films like this one. So let's apply our principles and see if we can understand this mystery. And our newest is this feature documentary, which should be on the major streaming services soon. But in the meantime, hosting Skeptoid is what I spend most of my time doing, and that's what I'm going to show you today. This week's episode is on the Cottingley Fairies, the famous photographs made by two young girls at the end of World War I. Skeptoid is a short format scripted show, so the first thing I do, which takes most of the time, is the research and writing to put together about a 1,750 word script, and it's got to thoroughly cover the subject, it's got to be authoritative, it's got to be correct, and every show has complete bibliographic references, as we really try to adhere to high academic standards while making the show as entertaining as possible. And this is how I start every morning about 6 a.m. There's some interest in the Cottingley Fairies right now, as there's a museum exhibit touring in England, I believe. So there's been some recent articles. Wikipedia is a great starting point to start tracking down some of the existing investigative work that's been done. And sometimes I'll have a book myself in my own research library. Here's kind of a goofy ghost story book that tells more of a credulous version of the story from the perspective that the fairies were real. Oftentimes I can track down other books that I need from university libraries, and Open Library is a source I use to find a lot of these. Didn't find much this time. Once I'm ready to record, I come in early, have plenty of room temperature bottled water on hand, that's important, and although I have a conventional microphone, I usually record using a wired pro lav on my forehead. This is the way they mic Broadway and opera performers, as it lets you move around more freely, you don't have to worry about cussives and plosives, and the quality's great. 
It's often said that young Francis and Elsie's pictures fooled some of the greatest minds of the day. Well, no, they didn't. Sir Arthur and any other great minds who believed the pictures were genuine didn't get fooled. They fooled themselves. And always make sure to record a few seconds of room tone. Room tone. Okay. So then it's time to edit. I work in Logic Pro. I start with a pre-configured template. I do all the basic editing, and then I turn my file over to our audio engineer who does some mastering, as we're in the process of moving to a new distributor and are upgrading our production standards. Here's a place where I whistled an S. Say there, Sonny, like an old guy, because I am an old guy. So I pop it open in a waveform editor, find just that whistle, and crop it out. In the middle of the episodes, I add the pre-recorded sponsored messages. Having the sponsored messages actually burned into the episode like this is a very old-school way of doing it. But part of our transition to the new distributor is that the episode files will just have insertion points, and the sponsored messages will be dovetailed into those slots dynamically. So a sponsor can buy 100,000 impressions or a million impressions or whatever, and that message will be inserted into all the episodes of the entire catalog and just for the duration of that campaign. And then the next campaign in the, in the queue takes its place. So we won't have to worry about sponsored messages at all, which is nice. It'll make our jobs a lot easier. Once everything's done and QC'd, I bounce out the free version of the show as an MP3. Then I cut the sponsored messages out and bounce the premium version that goes to our ad-free subscribers. Logic automatically adds both files to iTunes, which is also a really good ID3 tag editor. So I write down the runtime and byte length. Then I take the premium file and upload it to a podcast hosting service. Take the free version, I upload it to Amazon Web Services, because the bandwidth requirement on that one is really huge with so many listeners, and they give us a great deal since we're a nonprofit. Then I go to our custom content management system that's going to generate the RSS feeds, among lots of other things, and I enter the specs. Next, I need to make an HTML file from the script using an HTML editor, as that goes onto our transcript page on the website. And I'm testing that here, making sure everything looks good, the references are there, the sponsor's ads are showing. I also verify the free and premium audio files, listening to the same files the podcast listeners will hear. And that's basically it. The rest is all automatic. Our content management system handles putting the new episodes into the RSS feeds as their publication dates arrive, and sending out the weekly email newsletter to about 50,000 recipients with each new episode. And that's how I make Skeptoid. Thank you, Brian, for sharing that behind the scenes look with us. And I hope you all enjoyed a glimpse into debunking myths as we continue to debunk how easy it is to make things. Our next session is about random animation. Have you ever wondered about how procedural animations are made? We'll see a demonstration and how simple it really is to use random numbers to make a huge impact on animations. Uh, Watch Islam talking about random animations up next. Random numbers are used everywhere in computing. So computers can generate random numbers for us that we can use. Video games use that a lot. Examples would be something like the number of coins that you find in a box. Sometimes it could be the weather could be raining or snowing, different seasons and different times, and even random colors for characters in the video game. We will be using this function to generate random numbers. This is a function that will give us a random number between two numbers, and we can use it just by specifying where do we want it to start from and where do you want the last number to be from. So let's say this example, we can generate randoms between zero and 10, 50 and 100, negative 30 and 20. The computer then will replace those numbers by actual number, random numbers that will be totally random every time we run this code. Use this link to follow the code.
we have a simple fall leaf animation that rotates as it falls. And we will turn it into this. We have 100 leaves that have the exact same left percentage. They are all 10%, and we switch them to 50%, and they all fall in the exact same location in the screen. But we want to have some randomization. So we're going to say we want it to be between 40 and 60. So the leaves will be distributed in that range. They will fall in randomly between 40% and 60%. Let's switch it so that they cover the whole screen. So from zero to 100%. Now they all fall the exact same rate. They are doing the exact same animation. Let's give it some randomization to randomize the delay of each one of these leaves to give it some random numbers. Changing it to these values will give us this animation, but they are all rotating at the exact same rate. We want to give it some randomization also. By changing the rotation and the falling delay, we can have slightly offsetted animation that will give us something like this. Now, we want some leaves to fall faster than the others and rotate faster than the others too. So we will go we're going to randomize the range also here by specifying different numbers for each of the falling duration and the rotating duration. And by doing this, we can see that some leaves fall faster than the others. We are starting to have a closer look to what we're going to eventually accomplish. In your code, try different things, try different numbers see how each one of these numbers affected. You can have faster falling leaves or slowing falling leaves just by changing the range for random numbers generated for the falling duration or the rotation also. When you are done playing with those numbers, we're gonna move to give random numbers to the size to have larger or smaller leaves by changing the range also for the random numbers for the size variable. Here I'm going to have like medium to large ones. So I'm going to start between 20 pixels to 100 pixels. So some of them will look like they are closer to the screen and some of them will look like they are further away from the screen. And to give the illusion of out of focus leaves, I'm going to just go slightly between zero and three pixels um, uh, a blur and we will have something like that and to give it a fall leaf uh, the color for the fall uh, um, like orangish and reddish colors we're going to randomize the hue also you can also give different larger number and see what happened and we're going to make some of them darker and, and lighter by randomizing the brightness Now, try your own random numbers and accomplish your own look. And joining me is Islam to talk more a little bit about random animations. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for putting that together. Uh, I My first animation class was actually from you. <laughs> so it's really cool to share how accessible and easy that kind of form of digital making really is. Definitely. I, I, I am fascinated by how simple it is to just ask the computers to do our, to do our job, right? And Definitely. Instead of asking me, it's okay to guess one or two numbers, I can easily do that. But if I have uh, a thousand falling leaves and you're asking me to vary each letter one of them, that would take forever. But I can ask <laughs> the computer to generate uh, a million random number. Actually, I tried to do that. And that would take like less than tenth of a second to generate a million number. Computers are awesome. Thank you Definitely. so much. Thank you so much, Islam, for joining us. And that code is available on CodePen for you to play yep. around and learn more on animations. Have fun, try things, experiment. That's the point of making. Yep. Don't worry about breaking the code. Try exaggerating the numbers. Have a size of a billion and see what happens.
Awesome. Thank you so much again, Islam. And for those of you that do not know him, he is a professor at Oregon State University in the Digital Communications and Arts program, doing everything from information visualization to animation. So thank you again for joining us. Up next, we have cosplay sewing, and jo Chloe will be joining us again. Have you ever wanted to wear your favorite character's jacket? Or perhaps you just really want to sport an epic cape around to demonstrate your power? Why not make it yourself? Learn how to get started with sewing and cosplay. Hi, I'm Chloe. And hi, I'm Kat. And we're cosplayers. We're here to tell you about sewing and cosplay. What can you do with sewing, you might be asking. Well, you can do a lot of things. So we have some great examples laid out here that we made with our own hands. Most of these things started as a pile of fabric. Yeah. <laughs> Anytime you want to make a replica of something but you can't find the exact costume piece, why not make it yourself? It's more rewarding and you'll be able to make it the way that you want. So you might be asking, well, how do I begin? It seems intimidating at first, but don't worry. First, you'll need to find a pattern and materials. You can make a pattern or find one. Sometimes there are patterns online for free, and you might even find a specific pattern for the character that you want. But keep in mind, you don't need a pattern. They are very helpful guides, but not required. You can make a pattern from existing clothes in your closet. For example, my tracer leggings. I just had an old pair of leggings that I used traced them onto the fabric that I wanted to make these out of, and voila, a pattern. <laughs> Once you know what you're making, the next step is to find your materials. Fabric isn't the only thing you need. Consider thread, clasps, zippers, buttons, etc. Step two is prepare your materials. Iron out your fabric if necessary. If using a printed pattern, pin it onto your fabric. Then you're gonna wanna cut it out with fabric scissors. Make sure you label your pieces so you don't lose track of them. Don't forget any darts or dots. A printed pattern will often have little triangles or markings to note where things attach on the pattern, and you need to have those in order to fit, put it together. It's very useful to have a washable fabric pencil to make note of these. Don't throw away your patterns when you're done with your project. You can use them again and again. And most importantly, don't forget your seam allowance. <laughs> Big one right there. Yeah. Especially when you're making something that you're not using a pattern for. Most patterns will have seam allowance on the pattern, but it's still important to note that you need to make things a little bit bigger when you're cutting them out so that when you actually put them together, you have room to fold the fabric and sew it. Step three is get sewing. If you don't have a sewing machine, that's totally okay. It's easier to use one and will save you a lot of time, so see if you can borrow one or use one at the DIY cave. Next, you pin your pieces together. Put the pins the correct way. This will help for ease when sewing. Um, the correct way would be facing away from you. That way you can pull them out as you go. If mistakes are made during the sewing process, don't panic. Seam rippers exist and they're very handy and I use them more than I'd like to admit. <laughs> <laughs> if you are really worried though, you can use a basting stitch, which basically is a super wide stitch that is much easier to remove. A lot of sewing machines have many types of stitches, but don't get overwhelmed. There's only a couple that you need to know. The basic stitch is a straight stitch and you'll be using it for most things. The zigzag stitch is really helpful for stretchy materials since the straight stitch is not stretchy. Don't forget back stitching when working on your final stitches. It helps keep your stitches strong and makes your thread stay in place. Back stitching is basically just going back and forth a couple times on each end of your stitch so that the thread doesn't come out. Top stitching is when you're finishing a seam or making something lay really flat. Um, it can really add to your piece, but it is visible. So don't rush it and keep it close to your edge and make it look very clean. Before you know it, you'll have a completed item in your hands. If you're sewing for the first time, follow a pattern or a video on YouTube and take your time. You're learning. Give yourself time to learn. For folks with a little more experience, don't be afraid to take your own creativity into the project. You'll learn more this way and oftentimes you'll have a lot of fun. General tips and tricks. 
When you're making something and it's not fitting quite right, you can actually put it on inside out and pin it on yourself. This works with clothes in your closet too. Uh, you can call anything finished whenever you want to call it finished. As long as you're satisfied with your piece, you can be done with it. Sewing buttonholes and buttons is easier than you may think, so don't be afraid of them. Having a machine with a buttonhole foot and option is ideal. When cutting fur, don't cut like a normal fabric. You'll cut the fur too on accident. Cut the fabric that the fur is attached to. Slide the scissors under the fur to give it the cleanest cut. I personally like to cut fur upside down so that the fabric is facing up, and I usually draw my pattern straight onto it. That way you can slide your scissors right at the base and it'll be nice and clean and easy to do. When making items that have a lining, make sure you don't attach your lining until you are completely satisfied with your outside result. It is a lot harder to fix things after you've sewn in the lining. So, what did we learn? Sewing is a really great tool to have in your skill set. Making your own clothes and costume pieces is not only fun, but rewarding. Want to learn more? Visit your local craft store like Joann's and explore their stock. Inspiration can come from anywhere. Sometimes all you need is a little stroll through the fabric aisle. Borrow books on sewing from the library. These can be really great to get some professional tips and tricks with. And of course, you can always look up how-to videos online. We are blessed to have the internet at our fingertips oh, yes. and use that to your advantage. Most importantly, have fun and get making. Thank you. <laughs> it would help if I turned on my mic. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Chloe, for talking to us again about cosplaying. And that was your sister joining you in the talk, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's Kat. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. And I, I really liked what Kat said about it's finished when you say it's finished. I think that that's definitely a important part, not only of making, but to keep ourselves to continue making and trying new things. Exactly. Yeah. That's a really big, important lesson to learn is that <laughs> you don't have to bring something to whatever the, you know, you feel like the pressure of, oh my gosh, there's so much I still need to do, but I like how it's turning out right now, or I like how it feels right now, but the instructions say I still have three more steps or, you know, whatever, like, like that, just when you feel like you're done with it, when you feel happy with what you've made, you're done with it. It's your thing. It's your, project. you are the maker. You, you decide. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Chloe, again, for joining us. And we appreciate learning and getting kind of that inside scoop of cosplay. Uh, Cause I feel like it's definitely something that would allow a lot of students, particularly in high school to open into making, right? Uh, you, there's thrift stores that are very common nowadays that you can go and pick up old clothes or old fabric and repurpose it for something even better. Oh, is your, your sweater? <laughs> I go to thrift stores way too often for regular clothes, but also for cosplay. It's super, super helpful. That's awesome. Thank you again, Chloe, for joining us. Up next, we have Dream Up Game. Dream Up is a web-based game that inspires teams of people to be more creative and collaborative. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our next segment. My name is Savannah, and with us today, we have something special. We have the first ever live demo of the Dream Up game, and today showing it off is Ian, Ethan, and Amber, and I will let them take it from here. Hey, everyone. Uh, Ian here. Um, I'm a senior at Oregon State Cascades, and I work for the CoLab. Um, been working on Dream Up for since since June of this year with uh, my colleagues Ethan and Amber. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi hey there, I'm Ethan. I am a junior at Oregon State. I've been working at the CoLab for a couple years now, and um, when I'm not programming for school or work, I like to go rock climbing with my friends. And I'm Amber. I recently graduated from OC Cascades and I have been working at the CoLab for roughly a year and a half. 
Thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, I know that you guys have started a presentation regarding your project that you've been working on, and I'm really uh, excited to see what you have prepared for us today. Okay, uh, I'll take off the presentation uh, whenever you're ready. All right, can you guys see my screen? I can see it just good. All right, wonderful. All right, so DreamUp's a little project we've been working on uh, for about uh, five months now, um, six months almost. So yeah, it's a collaborative game designed to spark uh, your creativity while having fun and solving everyday problems with your friends and colleagues. Um, it's a project uh, that I we've been uh, working on uh, through um, the CoLab and uh, the High Desert Education Service District. Um, the game was uh, originally created by uh, Greg Garman, Eugene uh, Korzun Korzuniski, and Katie uh, Krummick. Um, yeah, so they've uh, been kind of guiding uh, us while we uh, kind of bring their game into the software world. So yeah, we have a web-based uh, version of their game now that we've been working on. Um, the tech stack that we chose to use for this was Elixir and Phoenix. Um, and I think we, neither, none of us knew uh, any Elixir before we started this, so we had to learn it on the fly, which was both intimidating and uh, rewarding, because uh, uh, I've come to really like uh, Elixir. Um, Elixir is a functional programming language, and uh, its purpose is to support the building of scalable and maintainable web applications. And the Phoenix LiveView framework uh, allows uh, programmers like us to build uh, programs that can support like real-time interactions between users, uh, which is what we're looking for with our DreamUp uh, game. Yeah, so for um, this project, we had a big decision to make at the start. Um, if we wanted to go with technologies that all of us had used before, but might not have been the best fit for the application that we were going to develop. Um, and so instead we took a bit of a risk and we chose to dive into new technology um, that was brand new to us. So we got to learn a lot through this project, which was a great opportunity. Um, specifically the tech that we worked with here was called LiveView. And LiveView is a bit different than um, some other ways that websites are made. Um, it actually constructs the user's um, page completely in the server. Um, and then when it's ready to show it to the user, that entire page is sent directly over um, the web connection. Um, so that's just one way that the Phoenix stack challenged us. Um, one other thing that was different about the Phoenix web stack um, is that it is a declarative framework instead of an imperative framework. Um, as programmers, we're most used to working imperatively. That's when um, we treat things kind of step by step and we explain exactly how we want to get to our outcome. Um, Phoenix is different in that instead of describing all the steps you want to take to get somewhere, you just describe the product itself um, in its finished state and you leave it up to the tech to do the rest of the work for you. So um, that was an interesting challenge for us to um, tackle throughout this project. For how the game actually works, uh, there are nine rounds. So once all the players have joined in and joined their teams, they'll be taken to the, the a screen where they choose challenges for each other. Uh, each team picks a challenge that they want the other team to try and solve. And uh, those challenges are things that the client is able to add to the database, just like with a lot of other cards that the client is able to add. So once each team has a challenge that they have to solve, they're taken to the board where they go through the nine rounds of gameplay. And uh, the first eight rounds are all pretty similar where there's a spinner that gets spun for the start of a round and it'll pick a type of card that will be drawn. And then the card that is drawn is a method that each team will have to use uh, to try to 
solve the challenge that they were given at the beginning of the game. And then some methods will also have time afterwards for the two teams to come together and discuss what they came up with for their solutions to the challenge and um, give each other feedback. And once, once those uh, first eight rounds have happened, there's a ninth round where the instead of drawing a normal method card, you draw a tell card that basically makes it gives you a prompt to pitch your idea uh, once it's fully made and your final solution to the problem. And uh, both teams do that using their tell cards that they draw. And uh, then they're taken to the awards page where each of the team leaders get to talk with their team members and decide uh, what awards to give to the uh, other team for their idea. So if they thought the other team had a really good idea because it was especially creative, then they can give an award that reflects that to the other team. And that's how the game is actually played. Awesome. Thanks, Amber. Uh, and I think now we'll uh, do a demo in browser of uh, the how the game currently works. And uh, just keep in mind that this game is still uh, early in production. So this isn't necessarily how it'll look when it's uh, out in the real world. I do have a quick question before we start into the demo. And Ian, maybe you can answer this for me. Who is playing this game? Who is your audience? Uh, I our main audience will be like young adults, uh, like high schoolers, college students, and uh, even like uh, business teams or like any sort of like, you know, group of people that are like working in team environments. It's like a really good like team building exercise. So yeah. those are kind of the main targets for who's going to play this game. Cool. Thank something you. The game, something the game does is it lets you practice your design thinking. That is definitely a tool that I know a lot of educators would like to use themselves in their own classrooms. So let's get, let's go ahead with the demo. Thank you. All right, sounds good. This is where our demo lives right now. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. All right. Um, so I'm going to start a new game. And when we start a new game, we get this uh, URL and it has a, um, a uniquely generated code that uses three unique words. Um, so this is like a one way you can uh, join the game. So I'm going to go ahead and paste this game code into our Zoom chat. And then we'll have everyone join. Those are fun words. I, I enjoy the peaceful pumpkin kitten game that we're about to play. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is actually one of the requirements they had for us was to build a build this uh, game code generator. Uh, Ethan did that, so he did a pretty good job, I think. And so these these players are being added live, correct? Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can see yeah Amber just joined, and you can see uh, her uh, she updated on my screen. There goes Ethan. And you all are playing right. this game currently from different cities yourself. Yeah, so I'm in Bend, Ethan's in Corvallis, and Amber's in Portland. So, yep, this is all happening in real time uh, remotely. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty cool. cool. Yeah. All right, so, uh, yeah, it looks like we're all joined in. I'll go ahead and start the game. Um, so we have a red team and a blue team. Um, I'm the game admin and the red team's leader since I made the game and I joined the red team first. Uh, it'll kind of just automatically assign me. Um, and so if I scroll down, we can see all these design challenges. Um, and then when we pick design challenges, we're actually picking it for the other team. So that's kind of an interesting way this game works. Um, so I'll just arbitrarily choose one. You can see that it updated here. And then uh, who's ever uh, the, on the other, on the blue team, you can go ahead and choose a red 
challenge and it should update. Yep, there it goes. So now, so now uh, this is my challenge and so I'm on the red team and uh, blue team assigned it to me and vice versa through here. So that's uh, how kind of the setup process works. And now since we're both ready, we'll go ahead and uh, the setup and it'll take us to our board game page. So on the board game page, you can see uh, there's a spinner that uh, just spun. It kicked us off into round one and chose a method uh, card for us. Uh, essentially, the method cards are going to be, uh, they're going to like uh, kind of uh, prompt us to come up with more ideas on our design challenge. So through each round, we'll, through each of the first eight rounds, we'll get a, a new method card and keep going through this process. Um, and then after uh, your team works on your method card, there's a discussion phase where both teams will discuss uh, how it worked. Uh, right now, we have the game set to go by, um, go through rounds pretty quickly, but in, when the game's out in uh, production, uh, we'll go through the rounds in like uh, about five minutes with another few minutes for a discussion phase. So if you were to play the game uh, all the way through, it'd probably take like half an hour to an hour, depending on how quickly you get through all of these uh, phases. Um, yeah, and then if you scroll down, you can see all the method cards you've already done, um, and they'll update here as we go through the rounds. So if I scroll down, you can see the other one we just did. Um, there goes the spinner, and then you can always see uh, the design challenge you're working with. This is what we picked in the setup screen, so you can always like refer back to this if you need to brush up on what your design challenge is. And let's say we have a teacher that's teaching a particular topic. Can they set those design challenges custom, or does the players of the game just get the challenges that they get? Uh, no, not right now. So right now, a lot of the design challenges will be, um, they'll be like, so you can select whatever design challenges are on the screen. So they do have some leeway with those, but I'll, but uh, the method cards are going to be uh, randomly assigned every game. So you, you don't really get to choose your method cards. Okay, cool. Uh, there, there is a way. Uh, uh, it just went away. But there's a pivot token. So if you get a method card that you don't want to do for whatever reason, you can uh, click this pivot button. Uh, and that'll give you a new method card, actually. And then there's also an add time button. It just went away. But uh, if you need a little bit more time for your round for whatever reason you can hit that here watch it'll so it'll select the met, new method card for round five and see there's this little pivot token so if you do that you can get a new method card i didn't really want to do improv right now anyways yeah <laughs> so yeah that's basically how it works and uh yeah so it's going a little quick but uh when i click pivot card it actually threw away the one it had originally selected and gave us a new one um, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and uh, skip the rest of these rounds and go to the towel round. So the towel round is unique. Uh, Amber already explained it a little bit, but it's a chance for us to kind of discuss uh, our design challenge further. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the last round. And after the towel round is uh, finished, then it'll put us into the awards uh, phase of the game, which is kind of the, the end of the game where uh, you'll just yeah, award each other uh, the most relevant awards for the other team. Um, we'll see it here in a second when the round finally ends, when the discussion ends. All right, yeah, so here's uh, the awards section now. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know, let's just say uh, blue team was the most delightful, so I'll go ahead and give them that one. <laughs> and you can actually <laughs> give them multiple as well. And yeah, maybe I didn't think they're actually impactful, so I'll just take it away or something. Oh. Like <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you can actually assign them every single one, and I don't know, you can remove them for whatever reason. And then, yeah, I can see the ones they gave me. And I can't remove them either since they're assigning it to me. I don't have any say in it. So, yeah, that's that's uh, the game in its current working state. That's awesome. And 
do you guys have, you mentioned that this is the first, well, this is the first ever demo that you've done of this game before. Um, do you yeah. have a production release date or any of that planned or kind of a schedule or timeline? I know with development work and <laughs> with making things <laughs> that it can always be adjusting. It's a work in progress. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we we've had to renegotiate that a couple of times already. But the the people we work for are really awesome and laid back. So um, it's it's not like working for like a big corporation where there's time crunches. So I will say that. That's great, and thank you all for sharing. That was really cool, and I can't wait to see it go into production and be live, um, so that people can use that all over for different challenges and different opportunities to teach not just design and critical thinking, but presentation and collaboration as well. I think that that's really cool, um, and. If we could go around and also kind of touch about how working on this product and making something, right? Making something that's supposed to have an impact and really help other makers. Um, if you could touch about what that's done um, to you, Ethan, if you want to go first. Yeah, it's been really an awesome opportunity to work with High Desert, De High Desert Education Service District on this project. Um, they're just so enthusiastic about the board game itself and um, getting to show them kind of as we inch closer and closer to the final product, um, it's been a really rewarding experience. That's awesome. And Amber, you mentioned you recently graduated. Um, are you working on software for your career or is this just for fun or? Yeah, so working on this project was uh, really cool because it was some of the first experience I got initially uh, doing a product that's actually going to be used by clients in the real world. And it's not just like some school project or <laughs> for fun. Program yeah. when it stops existing. So, um, yeah, this and um, my capstone have been a couple of the only times I've uh, we gotten to do that so far, so it's uh, it's been really cool. And Ethan, if you want to touch, or or sorry, yes, Ethan, Ian, Ian, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Ethan, Ian. <laughs> um, that, you'd be surprised. <laughs> Ian, if you want to talk a little bit about how you know going through this process of making and and what it's done for you. Yeah, this is uh, kind of like the first like big. Uh, coding project I've ever done and definitely the first one I've worked on in like a team environment. Um, yeah, I've gotten to practice like so many skills uh, that I uh, I think will be like very beneficial to me. Like we use GitHub on a daily basis. We're using like all the front end like web development uh, tools like HTML, CSS. Um, yeah, and then we learned a couple, uh, we learned like a new language, which is really cool. It's always good to put on your resume. Um, yeah, and we worked with, yeah, and then we've even worked with like databases. So yeah, we're kind of just touching a lot of like cool technology. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's just awesome being able to put, put it into practice. And uh, yeah, and then working on this team has been really great too. Ethan and Amber, super awesome. And I've learned a lot from them. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and that's so cool that you guys have had this opportunity. And you've mentioned the collab earlier. Um, would somebody like to describe that for those that are watching what the collab is? I can tackle that. Um, the collab is a department at the um, OSU Cascades campus. And um, they do a bunch of really, really awesome work. But um, specifically, um, our jobs as interns there uh, we interface with all sorts of clients, um, usually around Bend. Some of them are nonprofits, some of them are companies, and um, we build products for them. We've done all sorts of things from web development, um, business planning, um, and so this is just one of uh, several really, really cool projects that are going on there right now. That's awesome. That's really cool. And I think my, my last question um, for today is going to be, what do you hope uh, users of this game will get out of it, right? What kind of impact are you hoping um, turning this game digital? Because you mentioned it was already a board, a card game, right? Um, and 
making it a digital card game, you break barriers and get to reach people more. That's my first thought anyways, is the impact can be a lot greater. Um, for each of you, what has been, or what would you hope people get out of this? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, I think uh, I think a big impact that it could have is uh, now that we're in this uh, kind of brave new world where we meet virtually a lot, like it can be hard to like do team building exercises like when you're not a person and I think it is a is a great example of something that can like bridge that gap and kind of help teams build uh, even if they're meeting virtually so it could be a great tool for that and I hope that's what it can do eventually that's awesome thank you Ethan sorry Ian Ethan Ethan <laughs> you got it um, I think this is also just a great tool for um, when you're at the early stages of your project and your team's trying to come up with just raw idea generation. Um, at least when we've ran through it a couple of times ourselves, um, it's been kind of a fun way to um, come up with some silly ideas that um, can be surprisingly useful. That's awesome. Thank you. Amber? I think this is a really good game for students because it gives them an opportunity to get early exposure to uh, working as a team and design thinking and trying to agree on ways to solve complicated problems. So I, I think it's really good for that demographic. Definitely. Thank you. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, if people have any questions about DreamUp or uh, they want to learn more, where where should they check that out? Where should they go to? You can oh. find more info about the game itself at dreamupgame.com. And um, I'm sure we'll be posting a lot more about it on there. Awesome. Thank you all so much again. And if you're joining us live, please stick around for a Q&A. If you're watching this recording, I hope that you enjoyed your time and talking with us. Thank you, Ian, Ethan, and Amber for joining. And yeah, have a good one. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me for the Q&A, Ian, Ethan, and Amber. Hi there. Thanks for having us. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good to be here. That was a great talk, uh, hearing about the work that you've done. And Amber, I know that you have to drop off soon, so I have a question for you first from the audience. What's it like working in a collaborative maker situation? Uh, what did you like and what did you not like? You have a comparison kind of to your own work when you're working with a team member, right? Um, and so what, what did you take away from that on this project? Yeah, what's it like working with a team? Well, uh, it... It can be really helpful for giving you people to bounce ideas off of. If you're kind of in a rut getting stuck on something, sometimes you can actually go a lot quicker pair programming or uh, mob coding than you could just on your own. And um, in addition to that, there often end up being so many different separate little things that need to get done at the same time that it's okay for people to split up and kind of divide and conquer as well if uh, that's what's needed to meet the deadlines too. So I think as long as you're communicating with everyone in the group and like coordinating the work and not having multiple people do the same thing, it actually tends to end up making it uh, go much faster. Definitely. Divide, thank you for that. Dividing up the work, uh, learning from others, and that collaboration can often spark even newer opportunities and ideas that you wouldn't have been able to do on your own. So thank you for that. Thank you, Amber, for joining us and for, uh, even though it was brief <laughs> on the Q&A, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you for uh, all the work that you do with Dream Up as well. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Okay, Ian and Ethan, your guys' questions. <laughs> we have another question from the audience and it's, what inspired you to build games? It sounds fun, but there are a lot of other fun things in CS. So why this project? I think um, we got really excited about this opportunity um, just because of um, high desert education. 
they were so excited about the project themselves. They really uh, convinced us it would be um, fun and very worthwhile experience. And it sure has turned out to be. Shout out to one of our sponsors, uh. <laughs> High Desert <laughs> Education <laughs> Service District. <laughs> Ian, what about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, like, so it's personally what I want to go into uh, after I'm done with school. Like, I feel like uh, working on uh, games would be probably my number one choice. Uh, They're I, fun. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, they seem as much fun to create as they are to play. And I'm, so, yeah, so I would have chosen this project uh, regardless. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And that's awesome that you have that opportunity through the collab out of OC Cascades as well to work on these hands on projects and build your maker skills. That's going to really help you in the next career or choice that you make after school. Yeah, um, our last question that we got was what in, let me, let me make sure I got this right. Okay. Yes. Game development is really hard. Did you work with traditional game developers to understand how the flow works? What did you do to learn about game building? And I will add on to that. What advice would you give to a high schooler that might be interested in starting? Ooh, that's a, that's a big question. Yeah, um, it's, it's a good one. It's a really <laughs> and, good question. And thank you to everybody who's submitting those questions on Menti. Uh, High Desert Education did a lot of the work for us in um, designing the whole game for us. So the game flow and everything um, was already kind of spun up before we got working on the project. And so um, the development flow, was that kind of set up for you as well because the idea of flow was set up and that kind of about worked off of each other? Yeah, we um, generally followed uh, just working from the game from start to end. Um, it definitely was the, the most natural way for us. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think to learn more about, um, actually dreaming up these ideas and the board game <laughs> itself, talking to high desert education would be a great place to start. That's awesome. Ian, would you like to add anything on that? Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah we got lucky cause, uh, maybe not lucky. It just kind of happened to be the situation because I already had this game idea for the game, like dreamed up. You know, and yeah, uh, they I, just they wanted uh they wanted us to bring it to life in a like on a digital platform. So so we got started making like the web based version of the game, and uh, yeah, they had like tons of like assets. They had like all the instructions ready to go for us, and um, you know, the, it was like a little bit of an agile process too because there's oh, cool. like, so cause, yeah, we have like regular contact with them, like whether it's meetings or emails, we're like oh he, uh, look at our current version of the code i'm like oh i like this i don't like this maybe it should work this way so working with that customer or user yeah. feedback is really important yeah. in design development definitely yeah yeah so so it, yeah it's been nice like trying to use like kind of like an agile mentality to get it done that's um, great yeah so all right and a quick i want to make sure i get this right dream up game dot com, com. Okay, yes. so if you want to try it out and learn more about it yourself, go ahead and visit dreamupgame.com. And as Ian, Ethan, and Amber all mentioned, it's a collaboration between student workers from the OSU CoLab program, as well as the High Desert Education Service District. Thank you guys both for joining us. I'm going to kick off our next segment, which is Hacker Refractor, Shifting the Tech Paradigm. We're going to be listening from a couple of ladies on how they are changing the way that we see and view tech. So thank you, Ian, Ethan, and Amber for joining us, and we hope you enjoy our next session. Oh, hey, welcome to our next session in the Digital Maker Fair at Central Oregon. We are going to be talking today with three makers who are a part of an organization out of OSU Cascades, and they call themselves Hacker Refactor. Today I'm joined by Adriana, Linnea, and Nikita. 
and they will be introducing themselves. Uh, Adriana, how about you start us off? Sure. Thank you for having us. My name is Adriana. I was actually the first uh, Hacker Refactor president, and um, I was in the military for eight years. I did information technology and uh, cyber defense. And then um, I decided to get out due to an injury in my left hip, and I still wanted it to um, stay in technology. And computer science fit the bill. And so um, I decided to finish my degree here at OSU Cascades. And while I was here, I created this uh, this club and, and still thriving and, and it's doing well. And I graduated June of 2021, so last summer. And I work for a company called SDVI Core, and they deal with uh, large processing uh, video content, so like Netflix, HBO Max, and that gets processed before it gets out to the um, customers. And so I do full stack development. Awesome, thank you. Linnea, you wanna go next? Yeah, hi, I'm Linnea. I am a, uh, I'm pursuing a biology major with a chemistry minor and CS minor at uh, OSU Cascades. Uh, I'm a junior, uh, technically, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Hack Refactor's current vice president, and I am here helping the club do what it does, which we'll get to. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. And Nikita, the current president, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, of course. My name is Nikita Rubaki, like you said, current president of Hacker Refactor. I'm a senior here at OSU Cascades. I also have a job working for a small startup out of Boise called Natural Intelligence Systems. I develop programs for them there in the realm of AI and machine learning, which has been super fun. And here at OSU, I'm involved in a lot of other projects, but my favorite one is our club here, Hacker Refactor, and we love just working and building community. That's awesome. Thank you all for joining us today. And you all come from kind of different perspectives on uh, what really is computer science and making and different kinds of backgrounds. And here you all are together working uh, or having a part in the Hacker Refactor group. And if we could talk a little bit about what your guys' mission is as a group and a little bit more about that, and then we can get in more of the details and <laughs> the fun stuff. Sure, I can take that first bit. This year, we have tried really focusing on building community around the word belonging. After COVID-19 shut everything down, a lot of people got even more isolated than normal. And in STEM fields, a lot of people already feel isolated. So definitely, main, it's, a, yeah. it's not always a team sport when it should be. Yeah. Because, you, you know, individual contributors, as we're known. <laughs> Exactly. And so already you're dealing with a lot of engineering and computer science type people who are not necessarily inclined to gather. And then with COVID and all of the other things that happened over the last year, we really wanted to focus this year on bringing people back together in safe ways that made people feel comfortable and willing to grow and learn in particularly CS, but we focus on other STEM majors as well. And so Part of the things we've done this year to help facilitate such growth is run a couple of study sessions per week. Um, there, we're here at the CoLab at the Graduate Research Center on campus. So it's a place where students can come to campus, get together, help each other with homework outside of class. We also have been running what are known as bite sessions, B-Y-T-E, as in bits and bites, which are peer-led sessions on a very variety of different tech topics. Uh, we call them our tech soft skills. So everything from learning a new language to negotiating your salary to updating your tech resume. We're just trying to get people prepared and ready for when they go out into the real world. But more importantly, get people in a safe space where they feel like they are able to arm themselves with the knowledge and the expertise to go out there on their own and help other people do the same. I really like your choice of the word arm right there because you know there there is definitely certain situations where I myself am studying digital communications and computer science as well and there are there are certainly been situations not only in the classroom but in industry where I've kind of had um, 
to wear a kind of armor, right? Whether it's confidence or something else. Uh, Adriana, do you wanna, do you have anything that you'd like to add on to that idea of concept of uh, having that community or having that support as the person who founded this group that is giving it to students today? Yeah, I, I would say that um, that was a major part of my success throughout the program was having that community. Uh, when I was in, there were seven, eight other uh, women that were in my cohort, and we were all coming from different backgrounds, some from psychology majors, some from political science majors. And um, for me, even though I did come from IT, um, coding is such a different way of thinking. Um, so we kind of had a hard time just like, okay, like, what does this do? What's going on? <laughs> How do we make this ball move from one screen to the other? And it was just like this like um, camaraderie that like I personally loved, um, especially coming from the military, because we had a team that made um, the mission happen. And I think that's uh, what made me successful is that, you know, I knew I had someone in my corner that looked like me, that thought like me, and that um, regardless of how frustrated we are with the current situation or the current concept, like we're going to get there. Definitely, and and having that community is so important, and you know, kind of central to the idea of making as well. And it's part of the reason we're having the event today. <laughs> if you're joining us live, uh, Linnea, is there anything that you'd like to add on how Hacker Refactor has played a part in your life? Because you have the science side and the computer science side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I um, I found this group rather accidentally. Um, I am, of course, a biology major, so that's kind of my area of focus. I kind of hung with that crowd, and I, and then, of course, science, you know, you're, as you were kind of getting to, sometimes there's an individual mindset of, you know, you're working through your program on your own, and um, uh, I stumbled into a Hack Refactor meeting on Zoom last year, and it, it really kind of just, it gave me a wonderful community to be welcomed into and to have a place to go even in um, you know our my bedroom to meet and collaborate with other people even though they weren't you know necessarily within my major but we were focusing on things that I really connected with such as you know making that community making belonging and introducing people like myself who may not be you know always inclined to try computer science or have some kind of interest but maybe don't want to commit to a full class or don't know how to get started. Um, something that I've advocated for being a different major in this group of mostly computer scientists is, you know, saying to another biologist, hey, you seem to have an interest in computer science. Come to one of our meetings and see what we do. Oh, you know, we really want to encourage everyone to try computer science and feel like they have access to yeah. computer science mm -hmm. through and uh, community, belonging, very important words when it comes to trying to drive our actions and our mission. Definitely, and uh, that accessibility, Adriana, I heard I, <laughs> I heard you <laughs> second double down on that. Uh, one, it's it's one thing to run opportunities for other people, right? And it's another to make it accessible to who you want to reach. And uh, is there would somebody like to talk about what you all do in terms of if somebody wants to run an event and they want to make sure that it is accessible and they're trying to reach, you know, groups that they haven't been able to before and what advice would you give them when they're trying to grow or expand or, you know, get that reach out? Um, yeah, I can take this one. Um, so I think exposure in places and spaces that aren't conventionally um, normally for computer science students. Um, so maybe art classes, or maybe a math class, or um, just somewhere that's unconventional. And I think just making that exposure to someone who looks like them um, introduce computer science, be like, oh, I didn't know computer science was that. I thought it yeah. was this. And it, it makes a difference. If we go into these classrooms, um, I remember last, uh, last year or the year before, we were in a math classroom and um, some of the girls that were there were like really not interested in the computer science 
concepts that we're talking about, but then when we described it in a way that um, made sense to them, and and how it could like like make different kind of uh, pictures or solve solutions that was pertaining to their interests, I think that's what hooked them. Definitely, I, I know what hooked me was that engineering makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, after learning that, I was convinced. I was hooked. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I, if, if you all want to go and kind of share on what motivated you to go into computer science, because it's, it's not easy. It's a hard major. Mm -hmm. it, it can be fun, but it's hard. Um, so Nikita, and in and, and some of the other sessions, we talk about, you know, what is your North Star? And mm -hmm. what, what motivates you when you're making because as makers we're, we give a lot of our heart and you have to be vulnerable right because mm -hmm. i believe computer science is an art in and in of itself right programming everybody does it differently mm -hmm. um so nikita if you want to start with what's kind of your north star with computer science and and you can take that in any way that you would like to <laughs> yeah of course of course i mean when i originally started programming um, it's funny that you mentioned it being an art because I started programming because I did not want to be in an art class. And so, in, <laughs> true story, true story. In high school, you know, you have to pick your electives and it was basically like, you know, I went to a smaller high school and there wasn't a lot of options. And so it was basically programming or an art class. And I'd always been inclined, you know, I like did Legos and Lincoln Logs and things like that, but I was not a programmer by any means. But I was I had definitely Lincoln logs. Yeah. Those were great. Right? Yeah. So it was like, oh, like Lincoln logs and coding, those like probably go hand in hand, right? But um I was not an artist, and so I was like, well, I'll probably try better luck being a programmer. And, you know, now that I've been in it for a lot more years, I definitely consider it an art as well. And there's just a beauty to creating systems that hopefully will be helping other people. So in whether it's things I'm doing here for class, things I'm doing for the club, things I'm doing at my job. I mean, I'm always trying to put the best foot forward I can and build systems that will last, that will be robust, that will help people in whatever walk of life, right? Whether it's something small internally within a company or whether it's something bigger like the things we're doing with the club. And what ultimately drives me at the end of the day to keep doing computer science, you know, as fun as programming and solving those puzzles are for me personally. And getting stuck in a bug. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as much fun as it is just spiraling in like a bug rabbit hole. Um, I really just love connecting with people and bringing that joy to others, kind of like Adriana touched on. So many people think of computer science and they're just like, oh, you know, it's just a person in a closet like hacking away till 3 a.m. and I personally have never, I mean, I have been that hacker sometimes, but more often than not, it's collaborating with other people. It's, you know, taking those bugs and taking them to someone else and asking them how they would solve this problem. Um, it's finding just innovative ways to do new things with technology, right? Making technology work for you in pretty much any walk of life, which I think a lot of people think of technology in such a smaller scale, but it really can apply to everyone and it's widespread enough now that there's really no reason for any that anyone can't find something within the tech world that speaks to them. Yeah. They're North Star for lack of a better word. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'll jump in here being um, coming from a different discipline and just, you there's computer science everywhere these days. You see it in well, specifically biology, like um, in bioinformatics, you can see it in the music industry, you can see it in medicine, you can see it in art, and you can see it, you can see it everywhere. And so even in areas, um, even people who are in areas who don't see themselves as like, I'm not a computer scientist, I, I don't do code, I don't do computers, you know, whatever that thought may be, but if you can connect them through like, um, I can find a new medical solution using precision medicine and machine learning. That's also computer science. You can approach it from a different angle and you're still doing computer science. And so that's one of the things that um, I really liked about what Nikita was saying and also getting back to kind of our accessibility mission is finding ways to help everyone find their way into computer science um, that isn't necessarily strictly coding or computer 
science as a whole Definitely. discipline, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, it's kind of like trying to get people to eat their broccoli, right? Like once you just <laughs> <laughs> once you just if you can cover it for just put enough split cheese second. on it. Yeah, yeah, if you just can put <laughs> enough cheese on it, people are like, oh, this is really CS, and oh, it's actually really good, right? But most people just see the broccoli to start, yeah. and so we're trying to break those barriers. Um, particularly for minorities and other groups that aren't represented. Definitely, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Adriana, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, and, and having started this and coming from a background of, you know, military background, I, both of my parents were in the Marine Corps, so I, I oh, understand it's their what birthday it's like. today, Marine Corps birthday <laughs> I, today. I know, happy birthday, Marines, <laughs> <laughs> today we're recording. <laughs> Uh, I sent my parents a happy birthday message. <laughs> That's been done. <laughs> um, but it's, you definitely have that sense of camaraderie and having that team and that support, not only in your peers, but also outside of the community, right? Um, and also from adults and mentors. And a lot of what we're talking today in the volunteer track, if you're joining us live, is about those concepts of connecting those opportunities and those magic moments, right? Where somebody in the community and somebody in computer science and they, they reach that bridge and that connection and it sparks that interest. Um, so if you wanna talk a little bit about that. <laughs> um, sure, um, I think um, on the topic of sparking interest, um, um, I did uh, watch this one TED talk about this um, engineer that was um, trying to get engineering more accessible to other people other than the typical demographic. And um, she made this one book um, geared towards a more universal like messaging. And um, it got more younger people into engineering. And I mm. think that's what we need to be doing um, with this and getting people more interested and, 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 and stuff like that is having language that is more inclusive and um, showing that Definitely. the impacts that it has um, when other people have different thoughts and different ways to approach a problem. I think that's when we can solve more complex problems. Mm. Because I yeah. think if we just have one type of thinking, we can only solve one type of problem. Yeah. That's, that's, I could not have, nobody could have said that any better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That intersectionality that happens from different areas coming together. And we see this in making all the time, right? Yeah. That's what mm -hmm. making is. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a woodworker working with a filmmaker or you have a cosplayer working with um, a videographer. I mean, there you have all of these opportunities of different areas and walks to come together and really you know, expand and problem solve and see more than what we ever could have seen before. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. So, and how, so, we, so, we, so we know what to do, right? Yes. We know how we're gonna do this going forward. Now, how do we, how do we reach more? How do we, help others do this as well, right? I think- Do you guys have any words of it? Oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Nikita. <laughs> no, you're totally fine. I think the key, like we mentioned previously, is just making it as accessible as possible, you know, instead of having this big computer science tech monster, breaking it down. A lot of things bite we do- Bite size? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> breaking it down into bites. And that just, I mean, even as CS majors, I mean, you'll hear it all the time. There are just some classes and some topics that are so intimidating. Yeah. And the minute you yeah. start breaking them down, they become more easily accessible. But at the time, right, like if they're already intimidating to people who are like committed to this degree and who are like involved in it, I mean, you can only imagine if you're trying to just get people to step into that world, right? I mean, that's a very large barrier for anyone. It's intimidating. Exactly, mm -hmm. it's incredibly intimidating. And so I think what's important is just breaking it down into those little bits and bites, tech pun intended, and bringing it into 
people's spaces that they're already comfortable in. Like Adriana yeah. mentioned, right? Like where do yeah. people, where are people already passionate and how can you get technology into those spaces? Because yeah. we live in a digital world, right? I mean, there really is no place where technology cannot be added to help enhance, to help better things. I mean, it's already there. I mean, everyone has a computer in their pocket. Um, even right now, we're talking to you on Zoom, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> the digital world, we're holding a whole digital, digital maker fair. I mean, it's the world we live in now. And so it's crazy that we aren't teaching people at a younger age about this type yeah. of stuff, right? Digital literacy is definitely yes. a topic that one, I have seen needing more and more to be addressed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm sure you all have an opinion on digital literacy access as well. Oh, yes. Uh, as, as part of Hackery Factor, I hear that you guys reach out in the community and also visit schools. Would somebody like to talk about that a little bit more and the work you do around that? Yeah, so I can start us off on that since I've been to a handful and we're actually leading some this term. Um, what we try to do as a club is take our own members and other people in our computer science department here at Oregon State and get them into local middle and high schools here in the Deschutes County area and even a couple others. Like you said, trying to work on that digital literacy, Oregon really does not have a great system in place for its public schools to learn about computer science yeah. at all. Um, and it should. We it have should. Silicon Forest, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. We, we have all <laughs> these companies. We have all these great universities as well that mm -hmm. have excellent CS programs. Um, we have college students like in groups like yourselves. I, there's, there's no reason that Oregon can't step up its game when it comes to digital literacy in the classroom. Absolutely. Oh, for sure. And I mean, in recent, in very recent years, they've started to get some curriculum in place, but it's still not as widespread and adopted. And, you know, a lot of teachers don't necessarily know how to teach it because they don't have a background in it either. And it's just as it scary. It has to be accessible to them too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, if it's scary to kids, it's definitely scary to adults. And so what <laughs> Hacker Refactor is trying to do is bridge that gap for some of these teachers in schools by taking, you know, CS students and putting them in the classroom, giving kids someone closer to their peer set, um, people who, you know, in general know what we're talking about um, in terms of those <laughs> smaller sized computer science chunks and, you know, teaching, just teaching a class and saying, hey, like, you know, we're here um, a lot of times. We try and keep it local. So, you know, in other words, we're just, you know, the college right down the street that you can come, you know, say hi to. And we're trying to bring those CS topics in manageable ways to kids so that hopefully they will also, you know, spark that interest, right? We're trying to hit them at yeah. that critical age where a lot yeah. of people, um, especially a lot of those minorities, get shut out, right? You know, as that preteen teenage development where you know they're trying to figure themselves out and decide their future so if we can at least just plant a seed where you know the public education system isn't planting them and where society is telling them they can't um, maybe we'll give them just enough that they can and we'll pursue it that's beautiful yes <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> Linnea, would you like to add to that? I, I'm not sure if you've been able to attend any of the sessions, but I know that you, one, have many interests outside of CS as well, right? Coming from biology, but also with your love of music. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I actually have, I've done one outreach with Hackery Factor that was last year on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And in addition to being able to deliver this introductory uh, lesson on artificial intelligence that we did, it was also oh, very that's fulfilling. Cool. That's it was, not it was an easy it, concept. <laughs> it was it was a really interesting. Yeah, it was a really fun. Um, it was a really fun uh, visit. But anyway, even for for me as the college student, getting to go in and be this role model, and be able yeah. to just put myself out there and say, "Hi, I'm someone who, you know, isn't." I, I can say I'm not a computer scientist because I'm a biology major, but also like, <laughs> like I'm not like maybe someone you would uh, picture in a computer science role either. So um, it was just it was also fulfilling for me to be able to go and show up in my little Zoom window and be like, hi, yeah. I'm gonna help teach this lesson to you today, and we're gonna explore this topic, and we're gonna have a conversation about it, and it's gonna be so much fun. And it was, it was so much fun. Um, 
And so I'm really looking forward to doing that in person uh, later this term when we get to go in and do those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And just just giving just giving them that, that, that chance, that window, that maybe they wouldn't seek it out themselves, but now we're kind of giving them that option in school and so they don't have to like make their own way to find it themselves and definitely definitely yeah. the the uh, visibility as well as the accessibility right right mm -hmm. um and i i really enjoyed what you said about the giving gives back to yeah. yeah and sure. that's that's a wonderful part about making and i think what you all are doing as well um, and part of why your group has been so successful because you guys balance that very well when it comes to the um, building your group's community as well as outside that, yeah. right? Because it starts with your guys' group and it, from my outside perspective, I've seen you guys reach so many different students and make such a wonderful impact in your community. And uh, all, all I want to say is keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We will Thanks. definitely keep mm -hmm. it up. That's the plan. And so with that, I think we'll do any last closing remarks. And uh, Nikita, if you'd like to start us off, and then we'll go from there. And if you're joining <laughs> us live, we will be having a Q&A afterwards. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys for this awesome opportunity. Um, if anyone has any CS related problems at all, um, as always, feel free to reach out. Feel free to reach out to OSU Cascades. We're very accommodating. Um, and just this school in general is a great place to just get started with computer science. And they go beeves. Yeah, go <laughs> beeves for sure. Um, they just give you a lot of opportunities I have not even found at other places. So. It's a really, it's a really unique spot we're in, and it gives our club a place to do what we do well. So, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Yep. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I was when this panel proposition came up. I kind of, I hesitated myself, <laughs> thinking, you know, like, do I, do I have enough computer science experience to like really speak on this? Like, you know, and so I just want to kind of reemphasize one of our messages, which is that. Anyone can do computer science. It doesn't have to be specifically computer science, but maybe explore how computer science interacts with an area that you're interested in, and maybe that'll help lead you down a path you weren't expecting. And so I would just really like to encourage anyone and everyone to try something new, just, mm -hmm. just, just that. And if it leads you to computer science, that's awesome. And if I could reiterate how much you do belong on this panel. I just got goosebumps from what you just said. So I... Plus one to that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just to, have you, um, just to piggyback off of that, like, um, I think we're all hard on ourselves uh, when we come to, um, do we really belong in these spaces or am I smart enough? And, and the answer is yes, you are. Um, because, you know, the fact that you're here um, at this panel and you're not afraid to fail at something new, I think that speaks volumes, not to only all of us here, but everybody out there that is watching us and watching Hackery Factor. I think we're inspiring the next generation of makers and computer scientists and biologists. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone. <laughs> and so, musicians and rock climbers. Right? <laughs> exactly. Everyone, everyone, exactly. everyone. Absolutely. And you know, I think it comes full circle for me and I get emotional because I was the first president and knowing the fact that it's continuing to, to blossom and continuing to grow and strengthening in its mission. I think it really means so much to me. Um, and so, yeah, I would like to say thank you guys for keeping this going and inviting me. Thank you for uh, starting yeah, thank, it all. Thank you yeah, all right? for, yeah. for taking this time. It uh, It's so wonderful to get to talk with you all, fellow CS <laughs> students. Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Uh, thank you all again. I, I appreciate your time. And if you're joining us at the live, go ahead and stick around for the Q&A. And if you're watching this after the effect, thank you. And we'll talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Here I have Nikita with me to do some Q&A. That was a great session that we got from Hacker Refactor. And Nikita, uh, you are the current president right now. Yes. Is it the same vibe as it was when Adriana started it? Because it, it seems like a great opportunity for any student over here at OSU Cascades to get involved, mm -hmm. find their community, and really grow their relationships. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, since Adriana started it, we've just been growing, um, especially she started it and then COVID hit. So we had, you know, like everyone, just such a strange year. But yeah. um, being able to lead it this year as we are returning to in-person activities and in-person classes, um, it's just been very different. I think people are more willing than ever, more willing than ever to just connect with the community after being isolated for so long. So it gives us kind of this weird silver lining of people just being stoked on everything we're doing. That's awesome. And I definitely would call the impact that you all have <laughs> um, persistent. Oh, like oh persistent gosh. memory sticks around. <laughs> hey, Speaking of sticking around. You, you said you were doing a QA and a with me. You didn't say you were doing a QA and a with anybody else. <laughs> well, Nikita's so great. We had to have her for another. Oh, you guys are too sweet. <laughs> I feel a little less special, but you know. <laughs> Just spreading the love. Okay. <laughs> if you get a chance to check out the other videos in our other tracks, Jim is hosting the Mentoring Making Makers track, talking, which also features this discussion. Mm -hmm. And Nikita, I wanted to ask you kind of briefly, um, I know Hacker Refactor has had a really big impact on your life mm -hmm. and uh, it's had an impact on others as well. Is there any bit of advice that you would give to somebody that wants to start their own community where they are at? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the most important thing if you're trying to start a new community is to have at least a smaller one to begin with. So Hacker Refactor just started with a small group of, you know, six. Like this? Like this, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Like it started with like five, six women in the CS department who are just, you know, stuck in classes with men all day and wanted a different space where they could connect with each other and then it just grew from there so I think the key to starting any community is to start with something and let that seed kind of grow and blossom that's awesome and definitely making that space for yourself and for the group that you are with mm -hmm. is so important oh, whether sure. it's a maker space like we were talking about <laughs> earlier yeah, exactly. or whether it's a hacker club where you get to give back to the community find your north star and really kind of explore more of that mm -hmm. so I want to thank you Nikita for all of your time and the rest of Hacker Refactor <laughs> oh, Oh, of Keep course. up all the great work. You guys are wonderful. I know that you guys have, a, and I'll say this again for the third time, an impact on me <laughs> as well. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. It was such a joy to do that panel and to join you here today. So thank you. It was a fun conversation for sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so for those of you that are joining us on a live stream, up next, we have Status Report Klauski, Making on Exoplanets, done by <laughs> Rachel Loberger. Thank you again, Nikita, for joining us, and I'll see you after the next session. See you, everyone. Hi, welcome to the Makerspace here at Vanderbilt University, and welcome to my presentation, Status Report Kowalski. So, who has thought about living on planets other than Earth? What planet would you want to live on? What would you want your house to look like? Go to menti.com and enter, enter the code on the screen. Gonna take a quick poll. It's menti.com. Awesome. While you guys are filling that out, going to go into a little bit about who I am. So hi, my name is Rachel Loberger. I am from Hillsborough, Oregon. I'm a freshman here at Vanderbilt University. I'm a future space civil engineer, which is an up and coming profession, and I'm a lifelong maker. Now let's talk about the history of exoplanets. So life on exoplanets isn't a reality yet, which is why we're looking to science fiction. Books and movies, starting from the Martian Chronicles, which go through the exploration and settlement of Mars while Martians are living there, all the way to The Martian with Matt Damon. The book and the movie are both 
really good uh, references for how people live in structures on other planets. So these dates are the release dates for the books. And it's awesome to see over time how these things have changed. So here's an overview on what's currently happening, the Artemis project. For those of you who don't know, NASA is working on the Artemis project, which is to get people up to the moon again. <laughs> this is expected to happen February 12th, 2022. The progress they currently have on it is adding the final hardware to the Artemis one stack. So think of the rocket in like different pieces they've added the last piece to that stack. And the Orion recovery certification run, making sure that the recovery to bring people that goes back down to Earth will make it safely. <laughs> um, the biggest risk that they currently have are budgetary setbacks, so nothing in the way of innovation. Now let's take a glimpse into the future. We have habitable worlds. So space colonization, terraforming, all of these things. What world are you going to live on? Mars is a very popular version. Mars has ideas of life. There's history. There's um, frozen, frozen water. So Mars is a very popular option. There's also Europa and Enceladus. These are moons that orbit other planets in our solar system. And then, of course, we have the ideal place for life, Earth. <laughs> we, know what, we know what structures on Earth look like because we're constantly making them. But on these other places, what would it look like? There's three main options. There's the dome. For those of you who know Sandy Cheeks from SpongeBob SquarePants, she lives in a dome that is perfected to the environment that she can live in. When she leaves the dome, she has to stay in her own personal dome, which is what we would be doing if we choose this method on an exoplanet. Then we have terraforming. So this is a game called Terraform Mars or terraforming Mars. There's a board game version and a digital version. And it goes through how, how you would get from this red dust storm planet to an Earth-like planet here. Terraforming is the act of changing the environment to make it a different environment. So we would change the soil, give it nutrients that we need to grow plants. We would change the atmosphere so we can breathe and we would basically make a second Earth. Kind of cool. <laughs> the next one is mushrooms. W wait a second. So NASA has been working on using mycelia mushrooms that grow on like a skeleton structure of a building or a house or something. And using that, as the walls and the ceiling, all of those things. <laughs> Instead of bringing up to space, a whole unfoldable structure dome, every single panel for the dome, terraform materials, bacteria, we can just bring a little, little packet of mushroom starts, some water to make it grow, and an unfoldable skeleton structure. The really cool thing about these mushrooms is that they are stronger than concrete in some ways and lighter for, <laughs> for really cool reasons. And the last option, I lied, there's actually four, is 3D printing. So, I'm currently in a makerspace and there's 3D printed materials all around me. You can get a small 3D printer to make fun little keychains. But did you know 3D printing is currently happening here on Earth to make full-size houses? 
they bring up a, a combination of concrete and other materials, sometimes even carbon fiber, to make a sturdy structure that only prints using the necessary materials. One of the great things about 3D printing is there's no waste. You only print what is there, and the only waste that you may have is with a support structure if it's an awkward shape, but any domes like this and any other square houses that are being built using this manner don't require those supports. So why would we why would we want to explore exoplanet habitations? Well, space travel is constantly improving. We may just end up in an Ender's Game environment where light travel is just just a skip across the pond. <laughs> um, creating physical environments are essential. Making your house a home is something that you do, but making your house livable is what civil engineers do. And also the future of making comes from you. We can't do this without you. Any questions? Joining me after that presentation out of this world is Rachel Loeberger. Thank you for joining for Q&A today, Rach. Hey, thank you for having me. Some of you may notice a family resemblance. And yes, we do share a last name. And yes, we did grow up together. Rachel is my younger uh very well achieved sister who has aspirations out of this world. And I was asking her right before we joined the Q and A, what is that picture behind you? Um, so this is a photo of the surface of Mars. It's the first color photo taken from the rover that landed, I think this past year. Wow. That's awesome. So we did get a couple of questions coming in. And if you have more, please send them in through Menti. Our first one is, and this is actually kind of interesting. Is there any thought or research being done for locally sourced material for construction on other planets? By locally sourced, um, is that more of like? Like using dirt on Mars to build buildings. I, you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there has been um, some research on different clay materials that would go into the structures um, and terraforming, of course, the planet and what nutrients and what soil materials what would need to be brought up to the surface for that to happen. It's happening more on the terraforming side than the structural side. Okay. For what natural materials are we going to bring from here up to there? Um, but that is an awesome question. And I'm <laughs> sure they're thinking like lumber, silicon, concrete, cement mixtures. Definitely. And we, we have a, another question about the mushrooms. We actually have a couple, so I'm going to combine them. Um, people want to know how many mushrooms does it take to make a building? And for mushrooms and living structure, is it going to solve atmosphere or have an effect with terraforming issues as well with temporary living spaces? That's a, that's a mouthful, so. <laughs> but do you have any so thoughts the mushrooms on that? are a really new idea. Yes, they're really new. NASA hasn't put a ton out there. Um, Yet. Yet, mostly that they're, yes, <laughs> mostly that they're working on it and what they have so far. From what it seems, it's a small packet of like mushroom spores and little starts that will have water added to it. And then they'll grow to like their full size climbing along a structure oh, like wow. vines. That's really it cool. will mitigate the like atmosphere, but of course any openings for like viewing, like windows, doors, anything like that will need to be sealed up using a different material. 
That's really interesting. I, I never would have thought about having, you know, that transparency in your home and, and kind of what that means for living in a space as well. Um, and so as a maker, I, I mean, this is kind of a, an, and I'll say this again, out of this world idea, right? To be talking about making and building homes on another planet. Uh, and you touched on this a little bit, but are you going to be living on Mars or the moon in the future? I would love to live on another planet. <laughs> I think it would be really cool. It would be so much fun. And looking out a window and seeing a whole another view on space would but be But sealed beautiful. with different material. Yes, for sure. I would be there for research purposes only. <laughs> I could patch any any gaps in the walls or in the ceilings or oh, window. We have a guest visitor. Hey, Rach. Hi, Mr. Fister. Hey, a question came across Menti, and so we, uh, we just needed to make sure we asked it. Um, who's cooler, Savannah or me? Oh, gosh. Well, this is well, my track. And, and, and mind you, she's listening to your answer. I'm not because I can't hear it. So, <laughs> so you can say whatever you want and I'll just know that it was me. Well, since Savannah started me in the topic of STEM and everything. She said me, right? Yes, she said you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you that are joining us live, Jim is the host of the other track called Mentoring, Making Makers. And uh, he has been a mentor of makers such as myself and Rachel for many years. And having that role model and, you know, to push you sometimes <laughs> is really great. Thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us today. Is there anything else you'd like to close out with? I would like to invite every maker out there to shoot for the moon and shoot for the stars beyond. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rach. I know you're in the middle of classes, so if you need to drop off, go ahead. I'm going to be introducing our next session, Electronics and Cosplay, again by a maker that we have seen earlier today, Chloe. And lights and sound always take a cosplay to the next level. But how do you even begin putting electronics into your cosplay? Come learn about how to make your cosplays pop with the magic of science and circuitry. Thank you, Rachel, for joining us, and I hope you all enjoy the next session. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chloe. I'm a cosplayer, and I'm here to tell you about cosplay and electronics. Electronics can really enhance a cosplay and make it stand out of the crowd, and they're really fun to work with. They might seem intimidating at first, but trust me, they're easy to catch on to. So what can you do with electronics? Well, there's a lot you can do with cosplay and electronics. In my Tracer cosplay, I made this chronal accelerator that pulses light and looks like it's from the future. But really all it is is some LEDs and some simple coding. The possibilities are endless. My friends and I worked together to make a bunch of Halloween costumes for some kids this year, and we made some pretty awesome things with lights and sounds. That's the thing, electronics are more than just LEDs. For example, this wand I made not only emits sound when you shake it, but also makes twinkly lights. So you want to use electronics. The first step is figuring out what you want to use them for. Will you be wearing it, like my chronal accelerator here? Will you be putting it in a prop, like a wand or a sword? Or will you be using them for something on display on your shelf to show off to your friends and make your room light up all cool? All of these options are totally valid and will determine what kind of electronics you need because figuring out what you need to put in a costume to wear all day at a con is gonna be something completely different than a piece of electronics that are gonna sit up on your shelf. Step two, find your electronics, source your materials. There's a lot of places you can look. I suggest starting with Adafruit. They support cosplayers and they are a huge part of the maker community. You can also look at SparkFun, a similar site that I've had good experiences with. And if it comes down to it, check Amazon. Amazon has a surprising amount of stock when it comes to electronics. And although it might be less reliable than the first two sources I listed, it's still a great place to turn to if you need. If you want to as well, local stores are great. If you find someplace locally that sells the item you need, that's often better than taking a gamble and buying something online. Batteries are a whole different concept. So when you're buying batteries, I prefer 
LiPo batteries, these. Um, they're rechargeable and come in a variety of sizes, but regular battery packs work as well. I prefer these because I like to fit them into different places. They're better than a big battery pack with double A's or whatever. But also double A's and triple A's are a little more accessible than something like this. Step three, put it all together. It's always good to have someone help you, especially if this is your first time. And that's why DIY Cave is a thing. Come down to our tech shop and ask around. There'll always be someone to help you figure out what you need to do to get started. You don't need to be an electronics expert to make cool stuff. I'm certainly not. A lot of what I do, I learn as I go, and I learn from online sources like Adafruit. Adafruit is nice because they often have easy to understand instructions specifically designed for their products. And if you're using them in conjunction with 3D printing, they have lots of pre-made designs that wrap everything up nicely with a bow. So you have your materials, you have your instructions, and you're trying to figure out what do all these wires do? Even I don't know sometimes, but the basics are the red wire is positive, the black one is ground, and the white or green one is often data. What does that mean? Well, your data wire is what makes your lights blink and your motors go and do cool stuff. In my kernel accelerator, this is my micro trinket. It's the powerhouse, the computer, what drives my lights and tells them to fade in and out and pulse. The battery powers through the red and black wires, the ground and the positive, and they connect to the different parts of the NeoPixel rings that I've installed to make them turn on. Switches are easier than they look. Think of a switch like a roadblock. When the switch is off, there is a big roadblock there. It's stopping your energy from flowing. But when you turn the switch on, it opens up that roadblock and allows the energy to reach your electronics and turn them on. Switches are not necessary. For example, in my chronal accelerator design, I just plug in a battery and it turns on. Don't have any switches there. But for other things like a handheld wand, prop, or really anything else you can think of, a switch is a totally easy thing to add to your design. Soldering looks intimidating at first, but it's really not. You're just using a little bit of metal to glue two pieces of electronics together. When in doubt, ask someone. And if you're doing, tackling this on your own, Google it. The internet is your best friend, and I've learned a lot of techniques from it. So what did we learn that you can use today? Well, you don't need to know coding or anything super fancy to make something glow. If you have an LED, a wire, a switch, and a battery, you can put together a basic circuit and make some pretty colors happen. But then again, coding can be super fun, and it's great if you want to dive a bit deeper. You want to learn more? I'm most familiar with Adafruit.com, like I've said before, but I would recommend the Circuit Playground as a great place to start to get introduced to the world of electronics. It's a self-contained microcontroller that has lights, a speaker, and more. You'll be surprised at the amount of things you can do with it. Anything you want to make is fair game. Start thinking about what cool things you want to add electronics to and let your creativity flow. Most importantly, have fun. Thank you, Chloe, for another great talk on cosplay and electronics and joining us again for a Q&A. I remember my first microprocessor working on it in high school and getting an LED to light up for the first time. And it was so cool. Like, I, you know, it was we made like a little stoplight with like a little red, green and yellow LED. But just making something was so rewarding and so much fun. Electronics are really cool to work with. There's almost like this magical feeling to them when you get them to, to turn on or do what you want them to do. And you touched about this a little bit, but there, there's definitely an intimidation when people think about electronics, right? And there's that barrier of starting. So what advice do you have or what kind of tools can people equip with themselves with so that they can bridge that gap and take that first step and you know, make their first electronics project. Yeah, uh, it definitely was intimidating for me at first. Sometimes it still is. Uh, the easiest thing to use to help get you over that hurdle or to feel like you can start diving right in is to follow a step-by-step -step instruction project. So trying to put together your own circuit for something from scratch and getting a bunch of, of random, you know, 
items and trying to figure out how they go together <laughs> might leave you feeling very lost and overwhelmed. Uh, but finding a project online, like I said, um, uh, Adafruit is a fantastic resource. They have a lot of really great, fun, cool projects that you can put together that have really detailed instructions that walk you through it step by step and you learn by doing. So that's and a that's, fantastic way to jump in. Mm -hmm. That's great. And that's a great uh, point is following directions, right? Like you don't go into baking a five tier wedding cake your, for your first dessert. <laughs> <laughs> you practice following something a little simpler, like chocolate chip cookies or brownies, right? Uh, so it's, it's really cool to see how you are sharing your love of cosplay. And we'll be touching a little bit more on how you integrate that into your career later on today. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to touch on or talk about in regards to electronics? Um, I guess in, in regards to electronics and cosplay is like, uh, you, you'll be surprised what you can make glow and light up and make sound. Uh, making a wide variety of those, those Halloween costumes that I mentioned was difficult because we had a bunch of kids tell us, I want to do this or I want to do that. And we had to be like, how are we going to make a ninja light up and glow and have electronics in there? Like, that's not possible, right? And we when we were younger, we never uh -huh. questioned it, right? Like never. we had those ideas too. We didn't stop ourselves from that. <laughs> no. And so you can, you can make anything uh, integrated with electronics. And it's just a matter of thinking outside the box and getting familiar with the different options and opportunities. It's like, what do you want this thing to do? Like in your wildest dreams, if you had a really cool sword that you made, would you want it to make cool sounds when you switch yeah. around? Do you want to make a lightsaber? You can do that. It's just a matter of learning and practicing. Definitely. And there is a great talk on our showcase today that was live during the in-person Maker Fair. It is called the Innovation Panel. And we have a few game designers, roboticists discussing that concept right there, right? Breaking those barriers and really creating something new that not only like helps you out or is for yourself, but is helping the next person out. And we talked a little bit too in other sessions about how making is not just making, right? It's it's not just the end product. It's the story of getting to the end product as well. And I, I don't want to do any spoiler alerts for, for our talk later on in this, uh, in this track today, but I really appreciate you sharing your perspective, Chloe, with everybody else and trying to make these big concepts more accepted uh, palatable and easier to do for, for students. So thank you for sharing all of that. Absolutely. My pleasure. And I will be seeing you again after this next session. Our next session is image plotting. Come learn about the, oh, that is not the description. We're not talking about cosplaying again. <laughs> image plotting is a new package that is going to allow users to be able to plot images on a variety of different graphs and formats. It allows not only to be used in art history or in science applications, but it is an open source package that is going to be offered for multitude of users. Thank you, Chloe, for talking with us today, and we'll be off to our next session with Dan Paltz. A sec. Hi, my name is Dan Faldasek. I'm an associate professor at Oregon State University. I'm coming to you from my office to talk to you about image plotting. What is image plotting, you ask? Image plotting is a technique where you create functionally a scatter plot of points with information about a large number of images. And instead of plotting points, you plot the images themselves. This is a really handy technique, both for artistic production, for understanding and creating new images, but also for research. There are many times when we want to think about trends in image development or the aggregate image we might see, and we just have to hold it in your imagination. And that doesn't always work. This is why researchers in the social sciences and the humanities have all kinds of complicated techniques um, in field notes and different kinds of notebooks they produce from the field notes and films and samples and recordings. And you can see this, right? We have all these different ways we try to deal with the, the reality that this data is very hard to process and keep in your mind. About 10 years ago, Lev Manovich, then at Cal IT2 and then City University of New York, worked on a technique and a plugin for a piece of software called ImageJ called ImagePlot. 
and then image montage. These plugins for this other piece of software um, allowed researchers to take folders of images that they measured, typically in a separate program, although you could measure in ImageJ as well, and then to create beautiful plots of them. And his work on this is fantastic and really inspiring for all of us, and inspired three undergraduate students, Duncan Gates, Spencer Burnell, and Savannah Lowberger, to work with me after class for two more quarters with no credit, just working for the sake of working on bringing this technique to the R language, and especially to the tidy approach for R. So for those of you who aren't familiar with R, it's a very user-friendly language. And uh, the purpose of it is to make things very readable. White space is not a problem at as much as you need. And people tend to write really good commentary at R. Now, at documentation, we are use tidy. So what tidy is, is an approach where columns, like these three columns, are variables or information about something. Variable one, variable two. And over here, we have cases, like case one, case two, case three. So the idea of tidy is that every case is a line and everything we want to know about it is a column. The general purpose then of our package was to allow you to do image plotting, but then to create all of the measurements in R to handle all of the images in R, and then finally to make all of the plots in R and to make it as comprehensible and as digestible for a general audience as possible. If it still doesn't make sense what image plotting is, let me show you this. This is a conference paper I wrote a number of years ago using ImageJ and the ImageJ plugin called Envision Ebola. It was, per, uh, was presented at the 2015 National Association of Commu uh, National Communication Association conference. I worked on this also with a number of undergraduates. Um, the entire image isn't rendering quite how I would like here, but you can start to get a sense of how it's organized. These are images then of all of the news stories shared on Facebook in the fall of 2014 about this issue. And you can see that there are distinct, distinct regions and clusters, and they looked a particular way. So in this way, uh, it's a use of me, uh, the date is the x-axis, and the y-axis is the mean use of the color red. And you can see these pictures up here, up here at the upper right, uh, which are images of uh, Casey Hickox, who was a nurse uh, who was helping people with this disease. Uh, and you can see that there are different ways people represented her. And in this research, uh, we went and looked at the time series, right, and the sources and how different news sources chose to use different images of her. Here's another representation. This then is the mean use of the color blue uh, compared to the relative entropy of the image. And this one can actually really segment out the look of images about the story. So in the upper left, we have the really organic looking images, the images that often are more humanizing, uh, particularly of the people, of their faces in a real world setting. And toward the lower right, you get the screenshot posts and then some really interesting pictures of uh, Casey Hickox, uh, who was a nurse who was helping people that then are in this white background. And we were really interested in how the use of the white background interacted with the story and the timing of how it unfolded. And we think this actually did matter a lot to the visual framing of it on Facebook. The paper is available on SSRN. So here's our tutorial readme. Um, it's called Image Plot X. We had intended to call it image plotting. Um, throughout the life of it, inversion control and everything else, it eventually ended up with some numbers. And eventually, once you get to class nine, everyone calls everything X, right? It's technology. So we have a brief theoretical description here of why image plotting, and then our language we're importing. For our tutorial and for your general use, um, Savannah went ahead and created a bunch of images based on an, open, uh, an openly available image of Bernie Sanders sitting at the inauguration in his mittens uh, that were modified by an algorithm. And that is a great place for us to start because all the images have the same source, but end up looking different. So over here in my R instance, I have opened a fresh R instance, and I'm gonna go ahead and call for DevTools so that I can do things like install from GitHub. So I'm going ahead. I installed earlier and nothing has changed. All the depends should be right. If you need your mittens data, you go ahead and copy that into a web browser and that will get a directory in your downloads folder, which is just pictures of Bernie and his mittens, about 20 of them. You call your library, image plot X. And then for me, 
after I ran that in my web browser, it's the third time I ran it recently. And so I'm full test said, uh, damn full sec. That's my downloads and that's mittens. In this case, it's the third mittens. Now this will be different for you. Honestly, this is the single hardest part of this process is going and finding the directory on your computer where your mittens images are. After this, I think we've gotten it all taken care of for you. Uh, I would suggest you go into your downloads, pause the video, take the time you need to find that spot. So here we go, convert and import. So first we have load images. Load images. Now, you notice what we did there? It created a new data frame called images. Images has 19 observations of two variables. Those are the low path and the global path. The reason why we started this way and why we start our process is so that you can always have a canonical reference back to it. So we know exactly where they live on your computer and what's going on. Now, this is also going to be really useful for you as anytime you have data about your images, you store it with the far left column. It can be any column, but make it left for organizational purposes. Is a list of the file names. We can always add more to our data. And we run our second function, convert and import. Now we say images because it's the images we already had. It went ahead and created a new data frame for us called converted images. These images are all now PNGs with random strings. You can, of course, attach all these data frames together and build more. Converted then is a new set of images with transparent backgrounds of our data. And that's going to be important soon. We have a number of ways for you to measure your data. So we can say measured images. Do that with the converted images. And pow, it made another data frame. We're now up to three data frames over here. I will uh, excitedly circle measured images. Measured images then has a bunch of important information about how our images work, right? It has the number of the image in the file. It has their width, the color space, density, file size, all kinds of delightful stuff. You're going to discover that every function we run for measurement is going to put a data frame in your global environment. I know some of you would prefer that your functions never do that, right? Like, Dan, why are you filling up my global environment? And I'm saying we're doing this so that it's really visible for you. The purposes of this is to make it so everybody can find all their different measurements. And in a minute, we'll make our first plot. And that will make even more sense. So I'm going to need my dplyr library, get to dplyrs, bada bing. And we come over here and we also need ggplot2. As again, this is a tidy adjacent package. And we have these two functions here. Let's have a look, the two lines. So line 14, we're going to use bind columns for converted images and measured images. So this is going to take our overall data set with all those file paths, and it's going to put measured images in the same data frame. And we're going to call it My Pictures. My Pictures is now 19 observations of 11 variables. So we had two observation, two variables and converted, two and measured for a total of 11. We've written a handy image plot output code for you. Um, it's written here. It says image plot output. And in it, you just in quotation marks, you come in and just tell us what you want. In this case, my pictures, and then two variables that are largely trivial. And the last one, your X and Y axis, that's not trivial at all, is it? But in this case, we're taking basically random data. Um, the last one then is the alpha coefficient, which says 0.5. So all your images will be half transparent by running this plotting code. Let me go ahead and run that. And pow, look at that. The image number and the file size. You'll notice the one that has that beautiful edging actually has the largest file size. Cool, right? I think it's cool, at least. Maybe maybe you don't. Maybe it will get more useful in a second. Now, this is the basic idea of image plotting, is that you can take the actual data themselves and put them on a plot, in this case, a scatter plot. We have lots of different ways to measure. This was always a problem. We have dis intricate descriptions of color theory and other things there. We can go ahead and get our color analysis. And this will tell us about our colors. So I'll type it in here, color analysis.
converted images. Wow. There are some warnings here. It's because the semi trumpets are in backgrounds, but it's fine. Color results, you get the mean colors. You get HSL values. You get RGB values. You get illuminance. You get hue region, which is tertiaries. And you'll start to notice pretty quickly here. Okay, we go ahead and run our color analysis and view colors results. And there it is. A huge amount of data about how all these things have changed. And of course, we can join that right back onto our other data and we can have even more fun plotting. So let's, let's do that now. This is not in the tutorial. We're just doing this because we like to party. My pictures, find calls, my pictures, call the results. Now we can come back here and we can do something a little more empirically robust. It'll be mean red, mean blue. And there we go. Plot coming up. You know, this takes a few seconds. Um, image J also took a little while. Oh, interesting. We see the overlaps end up with a much richer color because it's multiple thick images. We see that images that tend to be white end up in the upper right. Images that tend to be blue end up more blue and less red. This is pretty handy, isn't it? We also have functions like symmetry, symmetry analysis, thirds analysis, edges analysis, our symmetry analysis function produces a really handy report that looks at it. If you fold the image left and right and compare how the differences in major features, it can tell you about that top and bottom. It'll even do it diagonally. It'll tell you if the corners are extra symmetrical, which is all very handy. You can do thirds analysis. The rule of thirds, uh, for those of you more familiar with image design, it can actually tell you which of the third lines the image tends to use. Uh, and it can tell you other things about it too. Uh, or thirds analysis is uh, fairly conventional for you in terms of the things it'll tell you about art. So it'll tell you uh, how intense it is on the lower horizontal, the upper horizontal, the left and the right, and ultimately where it's, the image is focused. Edges analysis does even more. It actually will look at the entire image, but it will also break it down into 16 little squares, which will tell you all about the different uses of edge in those areas. It's using an edge detection process. Pretty handy. Now, you might say, Dan, what can I really do with this? Uh, so far, you're making fairly straightforward plots, and they have all of this regular sort of ggplot2 backing. Well. Over here, you can see at the very bottom of our tutorial that you can actually call, uh, we've written out the functions for you actually to call this yourself using GM image. And our package depends on GM image. Uh, the issue with GM image is it was intended to be used for a very particular use case of individual images. And we took it and brought it into this workflow. So you can call the GM image individually. That's why we have all this set out with the local path available in all of our data frames. So you can always go and use GM image and then modify it with anything you want from ggplot2. I got to run my transport function first. Point one, so that sets your alpha and that'll run the rest. If you're having problems with your alpha uh, or a transparent warning, that's because you got to run that line, all right? We wrapped all of this into our plotting function. You then have this great world of Bernie and his mittens, and it can get even better. This is where the fun stuff really begins. We can take all of the stylized work from before, and we can add it. So in this case, we're changing the theme. We added the word mittens are warm, right? We can use all of our ggplot2 skills to change this. And last but not least, we went ahead and showed how you can use this with faceting. We'll facet it by hue region. And again, these are largely random because uh, it's the number of files in the directory and their file size. There you go. Now let's change the alpha just so y'all can see a little more. Let's make that 0.9 and rerun this. Uh, 
And here comes a faceted version of Bernie and his mittens. And you can see one of them ended up in the Violet family, two in the Spring Green family. All of this calculated for you in R, all of it plotted out with all of the features and control of the tidyverse for you. So why am I so excited about image plotting? Um, image plotting is such a key method. Uh, Love Manovich has done and is and and folks with him and all kinds of folks have worked on image plotting. It's spectacular, very useful. It is wild how few undergraduates and other folks have access to it, uh, given its power for changing how you do your own work in art history, how you understand news stories. Um, image plotting is a thing that I would love to see people do more. And so this package is intended to make it very accessible for anyone who's used the, uh, the tidyverse and R to be able to ingest images, do all of their analysis in a very user-friendly way, and output them all very easily. The most important things here, the two biggest pitfalls. One, you have to actually find your files and tell your computer where they are. Once you do that step, it's very straightforward. Second, you have to remember in your workflow that you're always joining those new data sets, your measurements, to your list of where all your files live. If you do those two things, if you find where your files actually live and remember to join the things, you should have no problem just with basic commands in your console or hopefully your script window to be able to use image plotting from RStudio, be it on a RStudio cloud instance, on your own computer, or possibly from some other implementation of it. I hope that you'll be able to make some cool image plots in the future. Um, we have documentation available and are always uh, checking bugs uh, to make things work better. I think I may have even seen one while making this video. Um, my name is Dan Faldestek. I'm in Oregon State. I'd love to thank Duncan Gates, Spencer Bernal, and of course, Savannah Wilberger for all of their work on this project. And uh, throughout the pandemic on Zoom, uh, it was a, real, a really wonderful thing to work with you all on this. And I really appreciate it. And I hope that you're able to integrate image plotting into your teaching, your practice, and your research in the near future. Thank you so much. Hi, Dan. Thank you for joining us. And that was a great talk on the research that we've done uh, and highlighting a lot of the work that we we were able to accomplish, like you mentioned, in the middle of the pandemic all over Zoom. Starting on Zoom in the pandemic and continuing on Zoom. It's, it's and been here we wonderful. still are. <laughs> yes, continuing on Zoom. So thank you for joining us live and for submitting this video. And I, I like what you said about how you acknowledge that you're finding bugs even as you were presenting. And we've talked a lot in many of the tracks today during the live event, how failing we often get a lot more out of than we do succeeding, right? And as a teacher and working with a lot of digital communication equipment, uh, what is your advice with failing when it comes to that kind of stuff? And how do you get over it? And how do you continue to learn and grow? I think one of the most important things is to understand the kinds of failure that happen in this world, right? Because sometimes you fail because you didn't try hard enough. And we know, you know, sometimes you got to try harder. But a lot of the time, that's not what failure is. So when I teach our studio, I'm teaching that class right now, students have to get over the idea that when it sends out red code, that doesn't necessarily mean it didn't work. In fact, it sends out red code in, in the console uh, just to say something worked. And so I'm so glad I got to take that class from you last year. And if you're attending OSU, take cultural analytics from Dan Faltasek. <laughs> it's like what Do it's like what doctor uh, the doctor said on the on the show with the with the police box where he's just like where they're like, well it's not a dangerous color, it's mauve. And he says mauve is the most dangerous color. Red is not the danger color. Um, and so seeing, seeing what the actual messages are. And so I was doing this last week with students. We were having some problems um, getting some libraries to load. And so one of the biggest things is you have to take risks and you have to try things, but you also have to, to recognize that when the thing isn't necessarily working, it's not a reflection on you as a person. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so if the message says non-zero exit status because this other package didn't load, we just go try to load that other package, right? And we don't need to hit the computer and be super frustrated or anything else because there, there, there's always an option. And even if that just means I walk over and by magic the computer starts working, which happens way too often. Um, and so what I, what I would say is failure is important. And I can't tell you how many times working on this project or others, it was just me trying things, watching old episodes of Family Matters and just 
fe- fe- feeling like it wasn't going to work until I wore the problem down. Uh, like Steve Urkel. Um, <laughs> and I, and I feel like as makers too, we often get very attached to what we're doing. Right. And, and we're creating art in a way as well. And it's, it, you know, knowing when to go a different direction or try a different thing or something like that can be beneficial in you making something even beyond what you thought you would be able to do. Absolutely. And being able, being able to change directions and change tools. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the hardest things is being able to figure out how to do something else. Um, Definitely. And, and we I, did get a question in from Menti. Cool. So what was your largest hurdle in getting data images to test your image mapping software? What was the largest hurdle in getting the images? Um, I actually didn't get the <laughs> images in this case. The largest hurdle was Savannah making them. Um, and once I, know, that happened, I, I realized asking the question as the person who got the images. <laughs> well, and first of all, first of all, that was it. But secondly, that was not a big hurdle because you were extremely efficient and they're really cool. And, and I think it's cool too, living in the digital era, right? We have access to so much information and so many different things. And you mentioned when you were plotting, right? You're finding patterns and correlations that you never would have been able to really visualize before. And I think that that's so cool as a tool. How do you see this large scale image analysis used in the next two years? Mm -hmm. And how do you hope it will be used after that? Great, great questions. I I, I know what I would say. (laughs) I think, I, I think there are a number of things. I think probably the most straightforward is to start visualizing um, the look of flows on social media. And, oh, interesting. Because I think, I think right now we, we know increasingly that we're dealing with visual platforms that the, although Snapchat use has decreased some among obviously the youths, um, compared with say Twitter, it's clearly ha- all these platforms that are more visual and have more images all are doing things. And so I think we've reached the end of what text mining can tell us in social media analysis. Uh, And I think people are always very excited about the next iteration of machine learning and whatever else on text. I'm working on a paper right now where I parse it seven different ways and I find seven different conspiracy theories in the same 900,000 tweets. Which I don't know if you caught Skeptoid earlier, but that's the exact kind of thing, right? That- finding that out and, you know, unveiling that new information. It's yeah. And so I'm interested in the ways then that they were doing the same things, but not with words. Right? I want to see the pictures. I want to see it like in the case of envision Ebola, clearly once the media decided to turn against Dr. Nurse Cox, they started using the white photoshopped image of her, like in wow. the, in the nether space where she was no longer human. Earlier in the story, it was all pictures of her out in nature, right? Mm. And so you can see how the look and of your feed itself is an argument. Like the, the medium is the message, right? Yeah. Um, so that's what I want to see first in the next two years. Um, second, I want to see everybody go find whatever artistic or aesthetic orthodoxy is telling them this is how this art has evolved. I want you to take screenshots of it, plug it into the package and see if any of that's true. Do some real testing. Yeah, right. definitely. This, this is so, so important for everyone is like throw it, you know, overturning all of our old assumptions. You know, you know, are the images getting brighter or darker? Do they have more edges? Do they not follow the rule of thirds anymore? Are um, they more complex? Are they? Yep, definitely. Are they more exactly. pastel? Are they more highlighter? Like, let's look back at the 80s pictures. And <laughs> the next version of the package needs to have the pastels detector. Definitely. And uh, I was just thinking about this just now while I was listening to the presentation again. I would love to do like a image plotting of like my wardrobe. I think that would be so cool, like using a fashion aspect of it as well, or um, maybe even with like cosplay, like we've been here learning a lot about today as well, and integrating those two things. And that's the, kind of the magic of making is getting and creating those intersections of different mediums that we never would have otherwise. Amazon had an initial product in this space called the Echo Look, and they never promoted it heavily. And the API was never publicly available. I mean, I was waiting. Um, And uh, they closed it down now. So like there's clearly a huge interest in the analysis of wardrobes, uh, either just through image plotting or through something else. Like it is entirely possible you could plug the data from this into a tensor. I can think of a 
many different sorts of applications for it. But like, yeah, fashion is so cool and so underdone. Definitely. Thank you so much, Dan, for joining us for the Q&A. And thank you for submitting that talk. And off to our next session, uh, we have the closing of today's track for the learning makers. We have storytelling, cosplay, and digital filmmaking as a career. Join Chloe and I as we discuss in our next segment how making impacted us not only as people, but also in what we're doing next with our lives. So thank you, Dan, so much. Thank you for creating the digital making major that I get to experience at OSU. And thank you for all of your support and makers. I hope everyone enjoys our next session. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our next segment here. Today, I am joined by Chloe, who is a digital filmmaker. Um, myself, my name is Savannah, and I'll, we will be having a discussion today about maker spaces and everything else uh, in between. So, Chloe, thank you for joining us today, and I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit more. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, hi, I'm Chloe. I am currently a student at Chapman University and I'm studying film production and computer science, but I have been a maker my whole life and my hobbies and skills are a much wider range. Um, I love to dabble in things, I love to learn, and uh, that's kind of led me to a lot of different paths and routes in my life. Um, everything from cosplaying to actual filmmaking to I mean, everything in between I'm welding and, and working with wood and automotive stuff, just a, a whole bunch of everything. <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit more about that. And if you're joining us uh, during the live event, we you might recognize Chloe, although she may look a little different um, <laughs> in a, some different attire. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how you got into making. Uh, it's not something that is always accessible to students. And I was fortunate myself to be a part of a wonderful maker space at my high school. And that's how I kind of got into, you know, the working with your hands and designing and making stuff and realizing really what's possible. Uh, so if you can start from there. Yeah, I mean, I credit a lot of it to my my parents, um, specifically my father. It all who, goes back to them, huh? <laughs> it always goes back to the parents. It's where everything starts. Um, my father uh, was always making stuff with his hands, my mother as well. Uh, I remember like growing up every year for Halloween, they would tag team and make up my sister and I costumes, um, whatever we wanted to be. Like my dad would specialize in putting some cool electronic lights in, in somewhere. My, my mom would do uh, sewing and, and such things. Just they would collaborate to, to make things hands on for my sister and I. Um, but that was just one aspect. I mean, they were always making things, both of them. And so I think watching that growing up in a home like that was really beneficial um, to opening my eyes creatively. I was homeschooled. They decided to homeschool me. Um, and so that also allowed me to really stretch out into the world and learn whatever I was interested in, what I wanted to learn. Um, and that, I like that vocabulary yeah. choice stretch, right? Because mm -hmm. making is kind of this one-stop shop for so many different aspects of life and so many different areas. Um, you and I were talking a little bit earlier about how making it gives you this community too and like this sense of accomplishment. And uh, I'm sure having that as a part of your education growing up was a big part of why you're doing digital filmmaking and computer science today. Yeah, it really was. Um, they really emphasized the, the idea of anything that I showed interest in. Um, they went above and beyond to try and get me around that as much as possible. When I started to get really into art and drawing, um, they made sure that I set aside time every day to, to have that as an op as a part of my education to have time to draw and time to explore art and the art books and everything like that. Um, and from there, I mean, that's the environment that I grew up in. But as I got older, my father decided that he wanted to open a makerspace. Um, I've grown up in Bend my whole life. 
And it, there wasn't anything like that. And so he got together with, with a couple of other guys um, and they started working on the foundations of the DIY cave, um, which I'm sure many of you have heard of at this point. Uh, and my dad is one of the, the founders and current owners. Um, and so I got to grow and watch that environment grow and change and evolve into what it is today. And being able to have that at my fingertips, have access to someplace like that, I feel incredibly blessed. Um, but also I think that that was just a further um, uh, expanse of, of, hey, here's a, a bunch of options and opportunities that if you want to learn something, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that you can learn it. And having that uh, as an as an option available to to a young growing um, learner, someone who's really interested in making stuff and getting hands on, um, was was crucial to, I mean, taking me to where I am today. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, and having seen you know uh, makerspace being created from you know from zero from nothing, um, and I'm sure seeing the. Uh, the impact it's had on the community and not just on yourself as well, right? Uh, having the access to opportunities like learning how to work with woodworking tools or uh, kilns or everything in between, uh, it really can broaden your experience on that. And so I, I, something I want to touch on is why filmmaking? Yeah. Right. So, so you yeah. have all of these options that you've been exposed to from, uh, you know, that most people don't ever get to experience and you picked filmmaking. So I'm, I'm sure that that must be a big part of your heart. Yeah. Um, film to me has always been uh, a place that I've been interested in. When I uh, was four, I started to get into film. Um, so I've been doing this for a while. So a very young maker. <laughs> yes. Um, I would put on plays and such for my parents, and I was always interested in watching, um, when I got a little older, watching the behind the scenes of films That's um, so funny. on DVDs. <laughs> do, you, do you have siblings? I have, I have a, a younger sister, yeah, but just one. <laughs> my siblings and I, we would put on shows growing up and so i can i can picture it because it's something that we would do we would set up you know all right i'm gonna go first and then you can go first and we would just kind of line up our different acts and skits <laughs> through, absolutely and throw it for our parents but it was and having that fun performative experience you know you you gain confidence in being able to speak and all of these other skills as well yeah um, that that's you I mean you hit the nail on the head like that's exactly what what we would do and oftentimes I remember when I was young I would do skits and sketches from films um, so any film that I was super interested in at the time because you know when you're that young you just watch like a couple of the films like you pick like two or three films you just watch them over and over because and they're your favorites and they're your favorites <laughs> and so I knew a lot of them by heart and so I would pick scenes my favorite scenes or moments and I would perform them and that's when my parents decided to start let, getting me into film acting a little bit. Um, and then when I got older, I was, I was given a camera um, for, for my birthday one year and I started shooting stuff as well as, cause up until that point I'd been like acting in things. Now um, what kind of play. camera was this? Was this digital it, or? <laughs> <laughs> it was a, I don't even know what brand it was. It literally was just a tiny little box with a lens that wasn't it, what you couldn't change it. And like, there wasn't any, there wasn't even a viewfinder. Like I couldn't see what I was filming. It was just like the act flip, flip of the filming. Switch. Yeah. Flip the switch and it'll film stuff. And then you can take the SD card out later and you have to see what you film. So it was almost <laughs> like, like in the old days of like actually filming on film, you don't really know you can, I mean, they had a viewfinder, so it was even worse, but like, you don't know how that turns out until you have to go develop the film. Um, so it's, and that's, that's of, a big part of making too, right? Like you're, you, you don't always know where you're going to end up and no. you're learning as you experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I started from very basic filmmaking roots, um, which I guess that's a, that's a good thing to note is that if I started with that and I am where I am today studying that the, the top uh, the fourth ranked film school in the world 
like go Chapman, <laughs> go Chapman. <laughs> um, not to brag, but uh, no, yeah. I mean, there's there's something to say about that. That that people can start from anywhere, especially nowadays that you have phones that can film in 4K and do things like crazy. You don't need a lot to get started if if film interests you. If that's something that you want to look into, you have so much already at your fingertips that no. you can use. How does somebody get into it, though? Because, I mean, you mentioned that so much. When I think about digital filmmaking, even figuring out the definition for it, right? Yeah. It can be so broad and kind of intimidating, right? So do you have any advice to those that may want to get in, into it and might be a little, you know, afraid to make that jump to tell their story? Because a big part of making is sharing your stories of making. Exactly. I think the best thing to do if, you, if you're interested in getting started or you're trying to figure out, you know, this kind of interests me, but I have no idea where to go with it. Um, start by doing what you love. If you have a YouTube channel that is your favorite and you watch it all the time and you're like, wow, this would be really cool. I want to try making something like this. Try making something like that. You don't have to publish it. You don't have to end up making it perfect and putting it online or anything. But it's the act of, of creating it, of dabbling in, in that medium that's what helps you grow. Um, if you want to you know, get started doing TikTok or something like that, I mean, I'm going to admit I don't have TikTok. I'm not one of those people. I'm <laughs> mentally like a boomer, and I will I admit that. Um, <laughs> but, but, I mean, the best thing I, that I can offer as advice is to emulate others work and that's not to say copy them that's not to say you know make you don't have to make an homage to what they're doing um but this is the ghost for i feel like any art medium as well if whether it's drawing painting creating stuff with your hands crafting um wig styling if you're into cosplay everything that i've learned has been based around the people that i follow and that i enjoy their work um that's where i get inspiration and that's where I often learn the most. And it's even better if, if you can find someone who like that who talks about their making process because you learn way more from that. Um, well, thank so, you, Chloe. Yeah. And, and with that, you know, uh, thank you for sharing your making process and how, um, I mean, for those of you that are not joining us on the live day, I encourage you to check out Chloe's sessions on cosplaying uh, as well, electronic sewing, intro how to get into it and thank you again chloe so much it's always so much fun to talk with you uh, because we're both makers at heart <laughs> and so uh with that uh if you're joining us live we'll see you at the q a thank you everyone Wow, that was really such a fun discussion with you, Chloe. Uh, I almost forgot that we talked about doing those shows at home <laughs> and performing even at young ages and just having those stories and sharing those stories um, with others that you know we care about, right? It's making is a, is a wonderful part of both of our lives. And I've been really fortunate to be able to connect with you and be able to showcase a lot of the making that you and your family does uh, at today's Maker Fair. So thank you very much for all of your time and effort in that and how you continue to promote makers you know with everything and everywhere you do oh thank you it, it's really been an honor to be able to share this work and and what I do because um it, there's I mean when it comes to making in all aspects uh it's you, you work really hard to produce something to make something and it's then you get to show it off and that's not a like you know thing that you can, that's, that's supposed to be something about being shell, selfish or narcissistic. It's, it's, you have this thing that you made and it's, it's your right to be able to show it off and feel proud of your work. That's, you can pour your heart and soul and money and time yes. into, into something. <laughs> and the way you get paid back is from, you know, th that fulfilling feeling of being able to, to share it with the community. Um, even if it, yeah. Yeah.
Definitely. And, and I want to thank you again so much for all of your help and work with this. We are so, and with that, we are going to be closing the first ever seven to 12 track learning makers of the Central Oregon Maker Fair digital event. We will be doing our closing at the Makers Auditorium. Go ahead and hop over onto that stream instead, and we'll see you over there. Thank you again, Chloe, so much. And all of these videos will be available to view after the event as well. Thank you.